it's not that it's not a good plot. It's just tough to get in there and hunt. You were yeah. like waving to me in the tree. I could see in the camera. Well, so, so, well, okay. Well, so here would be. <laughs> <laughs> There's like deer right underneath him. I see Jared. Well, like, okay. <laughs> so he, he, here would be. A Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Deer Grow. Heck yeah, man. Dude, we put a lot of food in the ground every year, you know, seemingly more and more, and uh, we have a ton of fun with it during the off season. Uh, there's some struggles that come with it too, though, right? Obviously, the back of my truck is evidence, you know, right now, it's mm -hmm. a couple of weeks after uh, I jackknifed, you know, a 4,800 pound uh, material spreader, you know, as I was coming down, and it's just it was too much weight for my truck there. But, you know, all those struggles aside, you know, dude, Deer Grill really has been a staple for our food plotting process uh, for several years now. Yes, we like to put lime and fertilizer on the plots, you know, if we can, but there are some that it's just we're not able to get to them or it's not feasible for us to get out of state with that stuff and so deer grow is kind of the, the quick and easy but still super effective option for us to be able to get the most out of those food plots that we can every year yeah, and i mean we're guilty of over analyzing things just like everyone else but that's the best part about deer grow is that it's going to create healthier soils which in turn makes better food plots and the fact is is we can simply spray plot start or plot till when we put the seed in the ground and then when that plant starts to grow we hit it with boost we know that we walk away when we come back, it's going to be a great looking food plot. For anybody that's looking to try Deer Grow, if you use the code HUNTER15, that's H-U-N-T-R-1-5 at checkout for DeerGrow.com, you're gonna save 15% on any of your Deer Grow products. It's a great way to get started on this and just see what the results are for yourself. Better food plots, bigger deer. And we're back. Hey, -o. Hunter Podcast, episode 176. Mm -hmm. Nick keeps us in line. Yeah, it's good to be here, guys. March twenty eighth. Yeah, but I'm cranking through. Almost, uh, almost getting through it here. Oh, it feels like winter is kind of you know behind us. Yeah, I think we're supposed to get snow next week, but you know, <laughs> nah, <laughs> yeah. Really? Oh yeah. Supposed really? Get, yeah, like on Wednesday or Thursday. Jeez. Oh, for sure, snow. Mm -hmm. Rain, Not like rain sna Saturday for like Easter. Rain snow. Yeah, next week. Mm. Like h high forties or mid forties into like low thirties type stuff. Yeah, well, you'll have you'll have some. You'll have that. But. So before we get going, wherever you guys are listening to us, uh, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, we appreciate you being here. Give us a like, follow, subscribe, whatever is appropriate for the channel. And uh, here we go. Here we go. We got uh, in studio guest Madison Raber. Good to be Welcome. here. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome back. Buddy. Welcome back. Yeah, second second time in studio. That's pretty yeah. impressive. Yeah, a little different studio now. Huh? It a, little, is. a little different. A little Stepping evolution. Up the game, man. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, I always feel like a real podcast. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, be careful. You better watch. Uh, yeah, people got a knock on the door. Can't just walk in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can't just peek around and see <laughs> what's going on. Just peek around. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, no, we, we were kind of talking about it, I guess, probably last week. And we're like, well, you know, it's now is that kind of time where we start talking about habitat and improvement and food plots and all the good stuff we're doing on a property. And I was like, well, you know, Madison, and I obviously just finished up a big project on the Ohio farm. So finally. I was like, uh, yeah, finally. <laughs> so I was like, why don't we uh, bring them in and we can just kind of wrap it all together. Yeah, it's fun. We're, we're week to week, you know, this time of year, it's like mm -hmm. a, a valley, like in terms of just the season, we, we're obviously doing a lot with burning and frost yep. eating and stuff like that. But as far as, uh, intensity of booking guests and stuff like that. It's just kind of like, Hey, mm -hmm. let's go flow week to week. And so, yeah, it made a lot of sense to have Madison. And cool. so yeah, welcome back. Appreciate it. We were getting pretty political there for a while, so it's good to <laughs> yeah, we have, to have a lot more lighthearted approach. <laughs> <laughs> take a turn back out of it here for a little while. Uh, yeah. Into the stuff that's more enjoyable and everybody can agree on off season. Yeah. Off season stuff. Um, so cool. Uh, I guess it, talk a little bit. Um, so Madison, we started this project officially in, was it October that we actually started cutting? Yeah. So the crews so. moved in. I would have to look back. I think right somewhere in that time frame. It was right around opener, I think, or mm -hmm. soon after. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and literally, I mean, they're done cutting. Obviously Justin's going to go down and do some stuff here. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, we literally finished up in the last two weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so, cause I got a lot of questions when we first got into that of like, you know, basically how long does it take? Mm -hmm. And you yep. know, that obviously depends on the amount of timber you're taking off and yep. terrain and everything else, but maybe just uh, so people can uh, listen into this who are thinking about it or, you know, um, maybe even have started even the, the cycle of talking to people about cutting timber, mm -hmm. you know, w what's, uh, what is a realistic expectation when you come into, you know, the amount of timber that's coming off and in a time frame um, for that to come mm -hmm. off? Yeah, I mean, it's going to obviously, as you figured out, it's going to vary quite a bit. A lot of that has to do with weather and uh, ground conditions. Mm -hmm. And so like this year we had a really, you know, wet, uh, didn't freeze much, 
pretty poor working conditions to get timber out over the winter here. Mm -hmm. Um, But that being said, obviously, I mean, you'd rather have your timber cut in the winter, generally speaking, especially if you're looking at, you know, the hunting side of things. Sure. Um, But I mean, generally speaking, if you got good weather, most crews can move around 50,000 board feet in a week. I mean, that's give or take 40,000 feet. Mm -hmm. Um, So obviously, you know, you average it out, wasn't near that Mm -hmm. with with yours given, you know, you had some steeper ground and then Mm -hmm. again, the weather conditions, so... Yeah, and we ended up, so I guess back up, we initially kind of had started with the main farm that I owned, Mm -hmm. which was 130 acres, and really there's about, I don't know, 120-ish on the one side of the road, and I think of that, if I remember correctly, you you had marked, what, like- 300,000. 300,000 on like 90 acres of timber, give or take? Yeah, 80 maybe. 80? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that was that was kind of the initial plan, right? That that's what we had jumped in mm-hmm. on, um, and it wasn't until we've talked about this on kind of the Abata farm side. It wasn't until later that you know understanding how that timber side works. Um, my neighbor called me, mm-hmm. and and they own fifty acres, um, but they've owned it for over twenty years and did not do a timber tax basis. Right. Yeah. And so they had called you to have you come out and walk yep. it, and there was good timber on mm-hmm. it. But the reality was, is if they cut that timber, they were going to have to pay their capital gains tax right. on it. Correct. Um, yeah. And previous to that, they had they had talked to me about, hey, at some point, you know, uh, our dad's getting older. We don't get down here as much. We hunt back home. They're about three hours away too. Uh, that they may end up selling it mm-hmm. um, at some point. Of which, of course, I was interested. So it it kind of mm-hmm. caught me off guard a little bit. Um, but the reality of the the finances and everything made sense in that, you know, I was basically going to have the ability to cut, I think it was like 40 some thousand dollars in timber yeah, um, something like that. right away uh, to help me pay that down payment mm-hmm. if I did acquire it. Mm-hmm. Um, so we did, we bought that. Um, I would say that was, that was in the summertime. So, or no, that was in, it closed in the fall after yeah, we started we had cutting. Yeah, we kind of figured that out. Bef- I mean, that was all taken care of before we started cutting. cutting. Yep. Yeah. Yep. yep. And then it actually closed, I think, right after we had mm-hmm. started cutting. Yep. Um, so that that kind of changed the plan a little bit in that we added 50 more acres onto that. Um, it came with a cabin and 16 acres across the road, which I didn't need mm-hmm. necessarily. But the 50 acres had been timbered more recently than most of your main farm, right? It seemed like it. Because it wasn't as good yeah. a timber. No, it was definitely not... Uh, quite the size of the stuff that was on the main yeah. chunk. Hmm. Yeah. Kind of interesting that when they, whenever they timbered that piece, that they wouldn't have looked at yours and been like, "Hey, give them, throw them an offer." Yeah, oh, I'm sure they did, but yeah. I mean, very, very good chance that at the time the you know owner didn't want to have it done. Did you meet your prior, the seller? Like, did you have mm-hmm. any kind of relationship with that? Uh, one of the sons. Yeah. yeah. Did he seem like somebody that would have would have gone for a, a timber sale at that time? Um, no. Why? The, uh, long time family property. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think he he inherited it maybe about seven or eight years before I bought it from his dad who passed away. So I would assume dad just didn't want to cut the timber on it. He got it. He lived about three and a half or four hours away. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they just use it as a hunting camp. It's an interesting mindset. I know like in a lot of big woods areas, especially like here in Pennsylvania, we run into a lot of people who are just very sentimental about their trees. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like most of the, you know, call them tree professionals, like uh, loggers, forestry Mm -hmm. consultants, you know, you that Mm -hmm. we talk to are like, well, hey, there's a lot of benefits to to cutting trees and certain levels of aggression and stuff. Where do you think that that uh, attachment to like trees comes comes from? It's like... do you think they understand that there's a potential negative to leaving them stand for too long? Is, are we misguided and yeah, our, our mean, opinion on that? Honestly, I mean, I kind of get it. I mean, I it's kind of weird. I mean, I've owned multiple properties now, and it's like, it's actually kind of hurts me a little bit to go cut my own trees. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I do it because I understand the benefits and stuff, especially from the investment side of things. Mm-hmm. But, um, I mean, I can understand the attachment. I think a lot of it more so stems from fear um, because, there, you know, a lot of, honestly loggers in general have a bad reputation sure um i mean i just the other day heard so a real estate agents just, yeah, we yeah. Can. <laughs> and yeah. it's just like 
it's, you know, I can understand why somebody were like, you know what, screw it, I'm never going to sell my trees. Well, they hear the horror stories. Yeah. And frankly, we've seen them. We probably all have. You walk out on a property and they're like, yeah, we select cut this 10 years ago. And you're like, what? Like, I mean, yeah, you took everything like 12 inches and up, <laughs> like literally everything. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's it's trash remaining. Do yeah. you think that's where the fear is rooted and that they're getting ripped off or not getting the value? No. Or is it literally in a sentimental attachment? Or is it just some of both? Think? I think it's both. Like mm -hmm. I had it, I had somebody come look at the Kentucky, the first Kentucky. Kentucky place that I bought because it's got some white oaks and it's got some red oaks and I was walking with the guy and this is before I met Madison like I didn't know anything about the timber prices and at that time the market was down compared to where it was when we cut but you know we walk up I know I have like this giant red oak it's beautiful like it's I remember meeting you on Instagram do you remember when that happened yeah it it's cool. <laughs> you know it's probably a 30 plus inch dbh red oak like it's it's huge mm -hmm. and he was like yeah you get like about 150 200 bucks for that and I'm like <laughs> there's no way I could cut that uh, like it's a hundred year old yeah. tree like yeah. to to turn that into two hundred dollars is like maybe that's where there's a little bit of that mm -hmm. that emotional tie to the tree sl slash well, conservationist that is, that is, as well that well, is the decision like yeah if you're open-minded to cutting timber the price that they're going to give you is like you're going to weigh that against how much do i like looking at them sure mm -hmm. yeah and that's the decision and if i had like a whole forest of those then it's like yeah cut a bunch sure. of them and leave some but like it was like the one like i knew when i walked into this valley every time this one pinnacle red oak was like always there mm -hmm. yeah. and so to like have to look at a stump and i was like wow i got <laughs> 200 bucks for that like yeah. that yeah, that doesn't seem well. Right. And the other, I mean, a couple things there. So one, Kentucky and like, um, say South Central Ohio, mm -hmm. um, the market for red oak is just pretty awful, to really? be honest. So like, a lot of the red oak, um, and I've learned this, you know, more recently. A lot of that, you know, um, the area that we're out of and where the buyers that would have bought your timber out mm -hmm. of um, have one of the best markets for red oak. Um, mm. and so, you know, the value of red oak is much more valuable, you know, central, you know, more Eastern, uh, further North yep. than it would be in and almost any places. other state. Yeah. Parts of Pennsylvania and other sure. areas have good red oak as well. But, mm -hmm. um, so part of it has to do with the quality of the red oak and other parts of it is just simply the market, market for it. For it. Yep. Yeah. So I think that's probably where some of that gets to, like, obviously on this one, like, you know. I don't think, um, uh, like there's a few spots that I like new trees on the Ohio farm where I'm like, Oh, you know, there's this giant red oak here, this giant white oak here, but literally it was, you know, there was a lot of good timber on that place. So it wasn't like there was a, just that one secluded mm -hmm. white oak where it's like, man, if they cut that, like, I don't have another white oak for acres around. <laughs> like sure, I didn't have your problem. <laughs> yeah. I didn't have that problem. So I, I think it's probably property specific and frankly, you know, and I didn't end up cutting that Kentucky one there, there wasn't enough good quality timber to cut at least mm -hmm. as of right now, mm -hmm. you know, so it would, it would have been like literally spot cutting the best trees mm -hmm. out of there, which would have probably had a dramatic effect on the property. Mm -hmm. yep. Let's circle back to that later. Cause I, you know, I've got some stuff that I'm dealing with we have a lot of good white oaks like mm -hmm. on, on our health farm and red oaks, you know, there's, there's valuable timber on it, but I have sections of timber that whether they got timbered hard at some point or just cause there was cattle on there and it has something mm -hmm. to do with compaction. But I mean, I've got some, I've got a 60 acre block specific. I'm thinking of on the Ramsey. That's just trash. It's, mm. it's squirrely cherries, mm -hmm. you know, maples, you know, which I don't think sounds we, like old past a ton of maple yeah. for it. You know, there's some like squirrely looking walnuts in there, mm -hmm. surprisingly yep. enough. Yep. So, yeah. mm -hmm. and I struggle with what to do with that. Cause I'm like, man, this is, it's a block of timber. The mm -hmm. deer do use this, but I, you know, and I clear cut some knobs this, mm -hmm. just here recently, you know, but it's like, what do you even do with a, a section that big? Yeah, that's, it's something really tough because I mean, your, your regeneration isn't going to be really that, really that great. It's not like you're going to cut down maples and get white oaks to yeah. come up in that in those areas necessarily. Yeah. Um, Part so, of me is putting about th thinking about putting fire through it is what yeah, I'm thinking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, I personally don't have a lot of experience with fire. We're discussing that. Well, let's get into that later. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, but then Winky does some very first hand yeah. <laughs> by himself. <laughs> he, <laughs> looked like, he looked like a, did you see that? Yeah, I did. He looked like a homeless guy living under oh, a bridge. Oh my goodness. Well, yeah, you'll have got, that. Got more nerves than I do. Yeah. Um, never did that by yourself is yeah. the lesson to be learned there. But, um, <laughs> balls of steel from Winky, something like that, you know, kind of what I prescribe to a lot of guys is basically, you know, cause I mean, cherry and, and, you know, maple, it's not that they don't have any value they can down the road, but when they're so tight like that, cause my, I can picture well, exactly what you have. Yeah. It's like my cherries don't seem to, cause when I, when I'm even when I'm out there, I'll call Jed mm -hmm. and like, cause he, he's 10 minutes down the yep, road. He'll tell yep. I say, Hey, I get these cherries. He's like, anything that's not perfectly straight. He's like, just cut it down. Yeah. All yeah. cherry wise. Yeah. yeah. And it's, I mean, you, you have to have some pretty good size. I mean, and even then, you know, you're looking at, 
you know, 35 cents a board for foot. You know, it's, well, it's some just of those big cherries, much. aren't they? Like some of the most vulnerable trees as well from yeah, like a windstorm. Really yeah. yeah. The suckers are, uh, what's the word for it? Um, they'll shit like they shatter. Usually. Yeah. Like they have shaken them. Yeah. yeah. There's no, uh, hinge cutting a mature cherry, like no, a, a no. young one maybe, but they, yeah. you gotta watch them. They somewhere. go over. Yeah. I think that's the big one when you kind of look in. And I mean, you know, I, I remember when I was, we were talking about bids for mine and, and rising had called me afterwards and he's like, man, we just, you know, as crazy as it seems like we struggle to find like a high quality property that we could manage for like long-term timber production. Mm -hmm. Um, that property set up for it. It just mm -hmm. wasn't in my cards of how mm -hmm. I was planning on doing it. But mm -hmm. he's like, man, it's just hard to find a place where we could go in and select cut as the market, you know, plays yeah. to it and manage it for long-term timber. You know, most of this stuff has been, has been hacked, you know? Yep. Um, and so that, that's, I think a hard thing for people to fathom. Like, it, you know, I've, I know I've talked to plenty of people in like on the recreational real estate side and they're like, yeah, you know, bought this property. It's got really good timber on it and you get into it and it's like, no, it doesn't like it, it's not good timber. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, sorry, I know I'm kind of bouncing back and forth on my stuff here. Like that piece that I'm talking about that doesn't really have a lot of timber value. It's like, I don't know, part of me would just almost consider, like if you were going to clear cut something, mm -hmm. maybe that, maybe that's the piece. Yeah. And so, I mean, in that, something like that, you would end up having to find some of that basically be using it for paper, yeah. you know, where they're clear cutting it for that. Cause there's no, no like marketable, like, uh, lumber for that. Hmm. That I seems mean, like it, a depending, thing I guess, to what find, size, right? I mean, how big are they? 60 acres. No, they, I'm saying the diameter of a lot of the trees. It varies. You know, it's it's kind of like a contiguous. Uh, there are some pockets of white oaks and stuff in there, mm -hmm. but I would say 80% of that 60 acre wood block is what I described to you there. Like, uh, I don't know, let's call it 30 year old, 20 mm -hmm. to 30 year old maple and squirrely cherries. So you're and, talking trees this big? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's just very little in that. I mean, you could let it go and, and do a very aggressive harvest then you, you just wouldn't get much for a return so you mm -hmm. know depending on what size if there's you know you could just go in and do like a 16 inch point of cut or an 18 inch point of cut you would get very little for return as far as dollar amounts mm -hmm. but at least I mean, if, cut if, for if, habitat yeah, exactly. yeah well and what good is it doing me standing there i mean that's you know that's the, well, gen there's the, the generational off, right? thing there. my yeah. mom is never going to go for it right but <laughs> yeah when i own that property someday it's not really doing me anything Mm -hmm. It could be doing me much better than what it is right, right. now mm -hmm. with a pretty aggressive right. harvest. But we've gone through in those areas already and just done um, because of the timber value is so low and it's never really going to amount to that much. We'll just go in and do clear cut pockets ourselves where I, where I want them. Yeah. I think so. that's the hard thing for people to fathom. You know, we dealt with it a little bit on the, like the pine sections on my place. Mm -hmm. And obviously you talk about this block is, you know, people have a tough time understanding that like you could have somebody come in and make pretty significant cuts to an area, but because the value of trees isn't really there, you're not going to make hardly any dollars on it. Like yeah. they may take yeah. a lot of trees, mm -hmm. but the value of them is so low that frankly, the, the labor offset cost mm -hmm. is like, you know, you're, you're really just getting habitat. You're not making money on the timber Correct. cut. Yeah. And I think a lot of people probably because in their head, they're like, well, no, it's timber. I should be making money. I'll just wait have poorer habitat because of it. They're mm -hmm. just going to leave yep. this crap stand of timber thinking that at some point they're going to have a better harvestable area for timber money. The reality is, no, you probably aren't. Yeah, like crappy timber doesn't just automatically get no. better. No, no. It and just stays crappy and A lot of that stuff bigger. is also, you know, so compacted as far as, you know, tr uh, um, basically stems per acre where a lot of it grows really slow. So I've seen this a lot with hard maple. I think you're exactly right. I think it um, is old pasture. You'll, yeah. you'll get into areas that, I mean, just tons of hard maple that are, you know, anywhere from four inches to 12 inches. And, you know, I talked to the one guy and he's like, I've had that for 30 years. They don't look any different. <laughs> you know, it's just like, you know, they, yeah. they just do not grow. And so, and in, in like we had a project the other day, I was helping somebody out. We went in and, and it's not quite that scenario, but similar tons of young hard maple coming up through. And, you know, that can have some value down the road, but they're compacted so much so that they're growing so slow that, you know, you're very, it's, you probably never see that return. So in, in that area, we also went and did some, some clear cut pockets and we did cut some, down some maples, especially if they had some issues that, you know, long term, they're going to have problems anyways, um, to, to free up some of the trees that were left then. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's wild, man. And it and it is so hard to, you know, that was probably, you know, this is a bit scary to pull that trigger on a cut in Ohio because I've never cut a property before, right? And once those trees go down, they're not coming, <laughs> they're not coming back, right? So, but I I think the reality was 
um, being able to see it firsthand and kind of what, what was cut and where, and, and obviously Madison and I talked a lot in terms of the strategy and stuff, but you know, I mean, there's still a lot of white oaks on my place mm -hmm. standing that, you know, in future years will, will be really nice trees. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, what I'm going to say here is not <clears throat> revolutionary or anything, but it's like, it, fortunately we've I've got, we've been on this property long enough and there's enough acreage there that I've been able to see some, uh, macro level shifts and stuff. And so as we've done like clear cut, like, you know, there's talk of solar panels in our area and there's been other areas mm -hmm. that we've done aggressive or, or even just uh, select cuts on and stuff, but where areas have been really opened up and I've done some of my own clear cuts where I've, I really can yep. concentrate and notice this as they, especially those mature bucks. It's like they, they do Sucks flock to in. those areas yeah. every year, the year after we do like a, especially a clear cut where everything's brought to ground mm -hmm. level sunlight's there where it hadn't been before. And this is in an area where it's predominantly ag. So it's not like they don't have open country. Yeah. It's just, they don't have thickets pockets mm -hmm. like yeah. that in the timber yeah. and they, they really they do flock to those things. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, there's a balance. I mean, I've seen, um, so it's interesting. So I've, I've done some work with drone deer recovery as well. And so, you know, you're seeing a lot of deer and it's interesting to see where these bucks choose to bed is often, you know, th they definitely like to associate with those thicker areas, but they also like to have a pretty good view from their bed. Mm -hmm. Um, so some areas are almost too thick for them where they'll kind of bed on the outsides of it. Just um, on the edge skirts mm -hmm. on it. Yeah. Yeah. You, I think you kind of see that. I mean, the more you start to learn about like the thermals and, and wind currents and where these guys are actually bedding at, I mean, I, I do think that they could, so that, that 50 acres that we bought, the, the entire top section was actually hit by a tornado, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, probably. And that extended into my original 130 a little bit. I mean, it was just a, th it's a thick knob. It's literally the knob on it. And you had some trees standing, but that's where we ended up putting one of these new food plots mm -hmm. into, um, but you could tell, like, I mean, there were definitely pockets where those deer were, but it was, some of it was just, it was purely impenetrable. Right. Like, you know, a, a big buck didn't want to get into that stuff. You yeah, know, he wanted to find those on edges the on the yep. outside and find a little opening and to get into a pocket in there. But, you know, they, it, it was almost too thick in some of those I cases. also think it makes a difference on, you know, we're talking about Southern Ohio, major elevation changes, you yep. know, extreme points. Over in your country, it's a little more subdued. It's not quite as extreme. And I think, I mean, uh, I might be wrong. Maybe. Yeah, it's not like, you know, when I think there's of definitely Kentucky, steeper Southern areas. Ohio country, yeah. it's not that. It's not big woods area. We have pockets of, you know, well, we have sections of timber, but we definitely have topography, okay. like significant but knobs. I've, I've seen where, you know, it tends to be a little bit flatter. That's where you can you can cut all the crap you want to, and it it, it they generally will bed in it. Just the... Whereas yeah, a deer that that's, is that's security. got a lot of elevation, they like to be able to see what's oh, going dude, on. Ours is, uh, I, I don't know if it's like the easiest to read or, but you know, but it's, it's textbook. Like when you go out there, it's mm -hmm. like, um, when, when I clear cut a knob, like on an Eastern facing, you know, point, it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, that that's where they bed, especially yep. if it's like somewhat overlooking a food source. And then the trick where we're at is coming in is flanking them oh, Co yeah. coming in from, you know, what I'm there's a reason about? they bed where they bed. <laughs> well, Yes. And so, and, and it, there's an easy advantage that we can take mm -hmm. of there, especially like on a corn year, like if it's, okay. mm -hmm. you know, either that or boy, I, we should just go out a couple of us. We should go yeah, out to some of fun. these stands and look at them and analyze them. I've got a few that are just textbook. Every one of those ones that produces, I can come in from a dead zone. It's either, at, you know, it's ag or it's pasture or it's something I can come in and flank an Eastern facing bedding knob. Mm -hmm. And I've got like a community scrape there in most cases. And they, those are my top producing spots. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it, <laughs> mm. <laughs> you've got, you do have mm -hmm. enough, you've got enough topography there with the way that that has more rolling Hills and stuff and, and pair that with the amount of open ground in there. I mean, it does make it pretty textbook. It's like, mm -hmm. they can only be here. They're going yeah. to funnel through here. Yeah. You know, where we're at down there, it's like, I mean, it's just contiguous hundreds of thousands of acres yeah. of timber. Yeah. <laughs> well, you guys don't have those as defined dead zones. Like no. that's where I'm taking advantage. It's almost to me feels those like yes and small and ponds. Yes and no. So some of that big wide open timber, you can kind of treat as dead zones. Yeah, sure. In, in scenarios. Yeah. Um, which was a little bit foreign to me. Like when I first originally walked that property, it was November of 2021, 20, I think. And, uh, you know, you're walking through and it's November, like everything feels good. And you're just like, 
like, man, this is this is an awesome property. The reality was is 90 acres of that was big open dead timber, basically. Mm-hmm. Like deer were moving through there. Mm-hmm. There were scrapes, there were rubs. And but like, yeah, you'll have a deer. It wasn't dead it wasn't there, holding but, yeah. anything, you know, near like what it should. Yep. You know, yeah. and it's just like, but you know, you kind of put blinders on it because you're like, you're just walking, especially when you've got terrain. It's like, man, 120 acres feels like 300 acres here. Mm-hmm. That is a drastic difference, I think, between, I'm going to just say farm country and timber country in general, especially like big woods. Yeah. Dude, if I'm walking through woods on my farm to get to a stand, you're it, blowing deer. It's the final approach. Yeah. It's like, that's, that's the high stakes moment. Yeah. You know, but put me in like a big <laughs> woods environment. It's like, the, a mile you're just yeah. hiking through yeah. yeah and so it's very it's very different in yeah. that sense. Mm-hmm. well it's because you you know again when we talk about like a lot of the deer that you're looking at it's like there's a 20 acre patch of woods like that deer is somewhere in yeah. that 20 acres right and if i look at like yeah you know exactly where they're at if i look at my side it's like i don't even know if he's on my property right now like yeah. he could be you know a half a mile that way do you feel like you're gaining a better understanding for that now especially that you've done the timber stuff it's like hey here's pockets where i'm expecting yep. you know your bedding areas basically yeah i mean so there were a couple key spots i knew that were bedding prior to the cut you know they weren't great but i you know it definitely held deer you could tell would you say it's mainly those leeward facing knobs and stuff yeah and where that tornado had gone through and yeah. stuff like that um you know and does were hanging down low towards some of the food and stuff like that you know, now I, you know, I'm not real sure. Right. Cause I mean, we select cut basically what I now have is 230 acres, you know, so 200 of that 230 is it's select awesome. cut it's a farm, dude. Yeah. And so, you know, that's going to create a lot of bedding. Sure. Mm-hmm. Those leeward ridges and stuff is going to, you know, be the, the common denominator when we probably find some of the key bedding, but it's like, you know, everything's going to eventually get thick. Like it's, mm-hmm. it's not big open timber anymore. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, at that point, I think you just got to get in and walk it. Cause yep. I, I, there is some stuff, uh, more of my uncle's stuff that's been cut really hard in the past and all of it's really thick. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you just have to get in and walk it. The Thompson is like that. Yeah. I, I went and walked it the other day and dude, I've walked that place. It's a, uh, whatever. It's only a 20, 20, 20 some. acre wood block, 15, mm-hmm. 20 acre wood block. And just somehow there's these big bucks that freaking come out of there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I've walked it for years, years. I've been walking this place. I'm like, oh, I don't know how to hunt yeah, this place. It's just indescript. And I do have a spot that I can, it's like one of those textbook spots. I freaking, I found it. There's a section, little section of this that I've never walked onto before. And you wouldn't believe the sign that I found. This was just the other day I walked mm-hmm. down there. It's like, freaking holy crap. Here he is. Like, well, right right here. that goes to show you when you have a cut done on a small property like that, and there's areas you've never walked on yeah. 20 acres. I yeah. mean, that's just, it makes a property hunt so much bigger. So like mine's 55 yeah. acres. That's a pretty small property. And the amount of deer that property holds, and especially mature deer, because I, I, I know my neighbors personally, and it's like, yeah, I have them, you know, they'll have these three and four-year-olds, and all of a sudden they're just sort of gone. Actually, the, the big deer I was chasing two years ago, uh, when he was five, uh, four, four or five, not sure, the neighbor had tons of pictures of them all the mm-hmm. time. Uh, the following year... Not a single point. I mean, he thought he was dead. Yeah. And I had him regularly. Mm. Yeah. I think that's what seems to be really crazy is how these deer, you know, I don't know. Maybe it was for a long time. Not, you know, not even that recent ago. It was like, man, if a deer disappeared, especially one that I'd watched for a year or two, I'm like, he's dead. You know, that's just how I went with it. And like, I think it was probably Kentucky that had open my eyes more to these deer showing back up after two years and i'm like mm-hmm. the hell like where'd you go for two <laughs> years like i'm not a picture for two years yeah, mm-hmm. that's nuts it's funny dude especially like in that blocky timber yep. stuff like ours is in illinois and stuff last night i was laying awake in bed last night studying these maps trying to find that booner from mm-hmm. last year i'm just like look i'm like here's a little wood lot like here's a little 10 acre section here it could be any one of those yeah. and it's like what's your strategy there do you just go and you know try to get permission on each of these little 10 10 acre wood just to walk them and see very different strategy because the sign is going to be a dead give but when you find that mm-hmm. you know that that's an indication they're there during the season yeah, yeah. you know but uh well one thing we looked at obviously like uh, being october was like when we initiated this this cut in ohio um you know it held bucks, but most of the mature bucks were like, they weren't having it right. The moment mm-hmm. the equipment came on and guys are in their cotton, like they, they were, they were out. But like, I think it was a couple of weeks ago when I was out there, you know, I walked some of the public and stuff that's on the backside of it. And I found where there's probably several mature bucks that had just, they just shifted. Mm-hmm. Right. That doesn't mean that they were never on my property. I didn't see many of them on camera, a few here and there, but they just shifted basically off the property while that activity was happening yep. there yet still position themselves in a place that they're, they're pretty remote. Like it's hard to access even though it's public <laughs> ground. 
Um, you know, and that's, that's what those deer are doing. But when you get into those bigger timber chunks, I mean, I think these deer are shifting a long ways. It's yeah. not like they're just shifting a block over or, or, you know, a couple hundred yards They're shifting half quarter yeah. mile. Yeah, type for sure. Stuff. There was a deer that I was after this year, earlier in the year. Uh, he showed up, uh, the year prior as a big three-year-old, um, or like 140 inch three-year-old and had a lot of character figure. He was going to blow up. He showed up middle of November, had him there until he dropped, saw him once or twice, was excited for next year, and, like, got one picture of him in September. He cruises through, and he's 165-inch, 10, just blew up, and big drop tine, and he ended up, I found out that deer was living two miles to the south. That's crazy. It's just crazy. It's just like, How would you find that out? Uh, Talking to some, actually, the the guy that uh, farms my neighbor, Got to know him, and he had him on his property. Just consistently. Mm-hmm. That's why yep. he figured he was living there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, dude, you know, two miles is like, think, you know, think about it. Jeremy ran 60 miles the other day. Like, it's <laughs> yeah. it's very doable. Like, when you look at a map or when all you think about is my 40 or whatever, yeah, it's yeah. like, it, yeah, that seems like a world away. But if you have yep. the ability to go and just walk, it's like, dude, that's nothing, especially under the cover of darkness. Right. You know? You'll see, I mean, like in this particular area, you'll see these huge draws that'll, yeah. that'll be like three miles long. That's where, that's where a too. lot of it ends up being is they're just moving up and down these draws. Yeah. Yep. Um, we see that too. They're those big macro yep. movements. Yep. You just zoom out and look at, yep. you know, hey, here's all these little cuts and draws and stuff, but here's the major yep. drainage. And then where do these bucks show up? It, it happens to be right at the yep. head of those drainages. Well, there's giant egg fields down mm-hmm. at the bottom of it. Yeah. And come the rut, they're all up on the top end. Yeah. And that's kind of where my farm sits in. Obviously, there's ag up top as well, but um, it's interesting to see, you know, they're summering down at the bottom in these bigger ag fields yeah. um, and then transitioning up into these bigger draws. Yeah. So I've actually seen, you know, looking, watching for property that I've seen, you know, properties at the very, very end of that draw. And mm-hmm. it's like having hunted a property now, you know, and I've, I've been able to actually have permission on a piece on the end of this same draw, uh, a couple of properties up and it's like hardly any deer on it. Like, mm. I mean, it's the same deer, but they aren't nearly up there nearly as much as they were right. further, further, further down. down. It's interesting. <laughs> The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Hoyt Archery. Oh, dude, it's almost fall. You and I are both going to be in a tree stand with brand new Hoyt bows. We're going to be shooting the RX-7 carbon bow this year. I know Hoyt's also got the Venoms out, both equally smooth shooting, quiet bows. Heck yeah, man. We got a convert on our hands this year. We got a lifelong crossbow guy with a vertical bow in his hands for maybe the first time ever, a good friend of mine. And uh, we've got them all decked out with uh, the inline accessories uh, from the QAD integrated ultra rest uh, to the quiver. And also he's got the SL sidebar mount with a couple of stabilizers from Hoyt as well. So that's going to be a sick shooting bow. Yeah. And Hoyt's been cool enough that anyone listening to this can save 20% on any of the soft good apparels online using the code Hunter, H-U-N-T-R, no E. Uh, And if you want to look at the latest lineup of Hoyt bows, check out your local Hoyt dealer. Get serious, get Hoyt. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the hardest part for for people, and especially when you start to look at the habitat that you're trying to create. I mean, it, you know, we talk obviously a lot about you know creating food and food plots, which I think is is super critical. Um, you know, but if you look at it on a landscape level or a macro scale, like you know, we cut 230 acres essentially where I'm at, and like that is that's a giant landscape level change of habitat mm-hmm. in that area. Yep. You know, and so the next several years, that that area will basically do a 180 compared to what it was. We also added, you know, another almost five acres of food plots up mm-hmm. on the ridges. We added access roads around the property. Like all of these things when, it, you know, a lot of this stuff as people are watching, and I know you've been putting stuff out on the Tree Stand Forestry YouTube as well. You know, I get people writing and, and calling all the time and they're like, man, like we just, we don't know. Like it's, it. this is the property that we have. We got one property. We can't screw it up. You know, and it's like, you know, maybe we know that we're not going to get a lot of money out of this, but it also doesn't hunt well. You know, Mm -hmm. it's like, you know, I've got one small food plot. I don't have great access. All these things, you know, you have to consider. And it kind of all ties back to the fact that you may cut timber off of your property and you might not make much money off of it. But the indirect benefits of potentially access roads or creating more openings for food plots, the natural browse and cover that's going to come with timber cuts, like all of these other things. It really depends on what your goal is. And that's what I told Rising. Like, Rising was like, man, we could manage this property long term. It's like, dude, my 
goals to make this a better deer hunting property. Can you manage to yeah. cut it down this year? This year? Yeah, I want to. <laughs> I want to cut timber off of it and make some money, and I want to have a better deer hunting property. Yeah. That that's well, my goal. It's not to manage timber for the next twenty years. A lot of people, especially on these smaller tracks, they get caught up in the micro of things you know i should add some apple trees over here yeah. i should do that this is just going to change my farm yeah you know switch along the borders of my food plot and it's like you know you can do all that stuff and i think you're making tiny incremental improvements but mm -hmm. you know if you're looking at a you know 50 acre chunk of just wide open hardwoods and you're trying to do these small little tweaks no you're not you're not doing anything. yeah dude the one thing that i uh and i gotta give you know some of these consultants have a lot more you know, experience is probably the word and probably knowledge on how to manipulate deer movement and, mm -hmm. and spending time, you know, so, you know, run down the list, rising knows what he's doing. Mm -hmm. uh, Sturgis, you know, Higgins, mm -hmm. all these guys yeah. have like, there's different styles and stuff in there. Uh, you know, uh, drumming log dude. Yep. Eric, Eric mm -hmm. long. And, uh, but one thing I really like that, uh, uh, you know, and you know, the nature of my farm, it's just historically been very, very open. Like mm -hmm. it's, they, in a lot of cases they're passing through and stuff and it, we benefit from the fact that it's a big farm but it's well, one thing i really like that those guys like kind of preach or, or are focusing on is like getting deer to spend more time on the property mm -hmm. um by yeah, by essentially thicking it up but also providing you know things for them to spend time doing whether it's a variety of food plots or like a, a series of scrapes or certainly the density of the property like mm -hmm. that that seems to be something that like you really can you really can take advantage of yeah does that make mm -hmm. sense yep. but <laughs> like, and I don't know, like I've, I, I, on our farm anyways, I feel like I'm kind of at the point where I'm like, I've done everything that I know how to do short of like some timber burns and stuff, which I think would help, mm -hmm. uh, a big shift that I was talking to Jeremy about that, uh, is going to happen for us in the next couple of years is we've got 300 some acres in ag that I put mm -hmm. in, in 2016, mm -hmm. that if they update the farm bill in next year or two should yep. be applicable for, uh, CRP. for CRP. Nice. Yeah. And so that is a that's a project to where i'm like i feel that i don't personally have like the expertise to mm -hmm. assign or design mm -hmm. that entire piece there yep. I, well, i'm gonna bring sturgis yep. in mm -hmm. and have him lay a plan out for us mm -hmm. and be like dude how much of this 300 some acres should we put into crp you know what's yep. the best what can we get a, a switch heavy stuff in there mm -hmm. and how do i design that around a strategy that's working for us yep. now mm -hmm. but but that i think is a a, a big scale version of the project that i'm talking Correct. about where yep. it's like dude make the farm hunt big not just for us so that it feels right. big to hunt but literally it takes a long yep. time for the deer to yep. get around well, you're separating deer as well yeah a hundred percent concentrating them in these little wood lots you know and i've seen time and time and again these these older mature bucks they want to be alone yeah i mean we all know this and like you'll you know they'll just be out in this random point where you know and even and even with mine it's it's a little bit of a struggle because i got 50 acres and it's not um super super deep Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'll have a lot of deer bedding in around me. Um, and at times I've, and I'll often have, you know, my target deer bedding on my property. That's not been an issue, but there's also times to where I'll see if there's a bunch of deer in, you know, he might bed on one of the adjacent points on one of my neighbors or something. Yep. Um, just to, you know, have a little bit, but he's still coming to my food source in the evening. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's something, you know, you need to be aware of, but when you have a bigger property, you know, you can don't have to worry about nearly any of that. I think those micro changes are, are kind of an interesting topic because, you know, I know most of the, unlike yours, like the, most of the farms that I bought immediately needed supplemental food, right? I needed food yeah. plots. Like they didn't have it historically. It was either pasture ground or didn't have anything in it. Um, and I'll say that like, I probably overvalued that a little bit. Like it absolutely is necessary and probably mm -hmm. helps from a harvesting standpoint. Um, but it, it didn't make as big of an impact as I thought it would. Yeah. Like mm. you would think if you go into an area and it doesn't have any food, it's like, man, you add food and there's deer everywhere. So where specifically, I know Kentucky, you did Kentucky that. was a big one for that. So it was Ohio. So I, mm -hmm. I planted the bottoms in Ohio. Um, and you know, it, it had good deer, you know, at least I thought, but like having talked to the neighbors and stuff, like didn't seem any better than it had been previously. Um, That's interesting. I mean, yeah. what, why, why do you think that is? I mean, the disclaimer on that is like, yeah, putting some food on a property is not going to overnight in increase your deer herd or the mm -hmm. quality, but it's going to give them a focal point of, sure. of travel and something for you to hunt. I think it comes back to the fact that your, your actual landscape level habitat has to be able to also sustain those deer. So for instance, if I've mm -hmm. got a, like in Ohio, I planted five acres in the bottom, mm -hmm. right? But 
but the habitat was big open hardwoods. Those mm. deer were probably passing in to go and feed there. Yeah. But you know, when it came push to shove, like they weren't they weren't stacking on top of each other or anything. Mm. There wasn't any room for them to go, basically. Well, to be frank, I mean, I walked pretty well every square inch of that property. Yeah. And and you could see in some of the thicker areas, even on the neighbors, where the beds were. Mm-hmm. I mean, there I mean there was beds on your property, of course. It's a hundred yeah. some acres. There's going to be, but not like, money. Not, I mean, no. not like what you're looking for. Yeah, and so you know, on that same side, I think in Kentucky, I thought, frankly, that would be a bigger one. I mean, I put whatever fourteen plus acres of food in there, and I think it did. From a the most of those deer survived this year, but um, that bedding habitat is not optimal enough to hold those deer. Mm-hmm. So they're there but they're not betting there, right? They're coming from other areas into that to feed and then they're leaving again, which, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, man, only the daylight opportunities in hunting season really matter. Yeah. You know, it's great if they're coming through at, you know, midnight on a October evening, but that doesn't do shit mm-hmm. when it comes down to hunting them. Yeah. Boy, there's uh it comes just with time in the woods, I guess, but like just even the uh, ability to identify like a, a, you know, a betting area versus, mm-hmm. uh, for years, dude. I mean, I, we walked miles and miles, like through woods and stuff. And you're like, you know, hey, woods, it's, you know, yeah. thick. They could mm-hmm. bed here. And it's like, and they, you know, they will, like butt bucks and some does and stuff will bed there from time to time. But like when you come into a bedding area, like mm-hmm. one of those knobs that we're talking about and stuff, mm-hmm. it's like, oh, like mm-hmm. here it is. Here's where like there's this uh, super concentrated, uh, you know, activity and stuff that that's what you're trying to mm, make yeah. with some of those clear cuts and stuff on your right. Place. And, and, and most of the time you're just enhancing what's already there. Mm-hmm. Um, cause I mean, you can't change the topography at can. the end of the and, day. And, that's, I mean, and I think, and that's what I was getting to in Southern Ohio, at least, you know, that's mainly where I work in, in those areas, the deer want to bed on very specific areas, period. Yeah. I think that ties in nicely to your point of the food is like, Mm -hmm. yeah, you can put food there and they need that and you can put water and whatever else there. But ultimately topography is probably their primary consideration when it comes to travel and bedding. Yeah. Yeah. And frankly, like that hill country, that farm has the topography in the hill country. It just, it it lacked the secure bedding Mm -hmm. on those prime, like leeward ridges and stuff. And I don't mean just topography in general. I mean, specific leeward facing knobs oh, yeah. frankly from yep. a, from a bedding standpoint yep. you know or bowls where they can bed that's mm-hmm. those are tough that's mm-hmm. one thing that screws me on our farm is there's a, a mega bowl that like I, if i'm anywhere to the west yep. of it like yeah. we're screwed <laughs> yeah. because it's going to yeah. suck in there so, and swirl and so it's the same thing i was hunting a big deer 2 years ago on my property and he would bed on an east wind which uh, my access is from the east mm-hmm. So it's perfect access, generally speaking, for any deer except for that deer. And he was smart. I mean, he had me figured out. And he would bed in this bowl at the head of the bowl. Um, it was an eastern facing an, bowl. Um, western, western facing. And he was bedding at, at the, the head of it. Yeah. Um, on an east wind. On an east wind. Yep. And I would get pictures of him early season coming into the bowl in the morning mm-hmm. at like six, seven o'clock. I'm like, okay, I know he's in the from bedding the area. West. Uh, yeah, he would often just come around the bowl from the West. Okay. Um, and so the one time I tried to hunt him and it was a little bit of a crosswind. It was like a North, it was supposed to be a straight East where I thought I could get around him. And it had a little bit of North when I got down there. I'm like, well, I know he's in the bedding area. I'm going to freaking it's hour and a half drive. I'm going to try it. And I was just going to cut him off because there was a white Oak flat that he was heading to in the evenings. And I mean, a little bit of my wind went down in the bowl and it was all over with. I get a picture of him sneaking out the back of the other end of the bedding area they just know, that man. afternoon. And I'm just like, holy crap. So I, I tried something different. I, I don't know that I would recommend this necessarily, but um, a couple of days later, I had him come back in exact same scenario, same wind. All the conditions were exact same. I'm like, okay, let's try this. So I, let, let me make sure I understand this. So it's a Western facing bowl. Yep. Is there a saddle in the middle of the bowl? No, I mean, no, it's just a, just a straight up bowl. So there's kind of a ridge that runs around it. Yep. Mm-hmm. A little bit of a bench yeah, on, like on a, the, in, 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 on the, like, like a top horse third. Shoe. Okay. Yeah. And then, and you're accessing point, from the east? Yeah. I'm basically on the side of the bowl was where north, I was going to drink. The north he, or south side of it? Uh, on the north side. Okay. And probably shouldn't have tried at that time because of the wind being slightly out of the north, but right. whatever. I was basically hoping to have him, before he hit my wind, be in front of me where I could shoot him. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. And so then what I tried the next time was I got a picture of him coming in. I walked t-shirt sweating, freaking ran across the field up top, blew all my scent I could down to that bowl where he was at. And I ran around to where he snuck out the last time and he did it again. 
just a different trail this time. And he was a little further, and I ended up missing the deer. Oh, <laughs> no way. <laughs> he was a giant. That's cool. That's an interesting strategy. Yeah. I don't, again, I wouldn't, I don't know. Cause after that, that like the second, it was, it was interesting to me. The one bump, you know, subtle like that didn't bother him. Second bump. And especially when I, I don't think that alone would have been an issue because there's a lot of foot traffic up there with the farmer. Um, but it was when I shot at him, I mean, you, like you could you could see he was just like, <laughs> you what the heck the is? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you well, shot at me. Exactly. You know, I think, um, to be honest, I think that's a big advantage in that in that hill, southern hill country of Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana even, um, versus where you're mm-hmm. at. And that I do think that those deer hang to an area and then just – bed bump based on wind direction whereas where you're at like i know mississippi state shows it all the time like look at all these beds well it's because it's a it's a fragmented Mm. habitat Mm. right it's five acres here 10 acres here corridor here 10 acres here i think you see those deer using multiple beds because you know they're out legging it and i think that at some point they're like man i you know i gotta get we do i gotta hide i gotta get down in here where we're at i think if you find where he's at as long as you don't mess it up, he's going to change a little bit yep. with wind direction. But well, and this was a six-year-old. I mean, very mature yeah, deer. He knew where he needed deer. to be. Um, I mean, I don't really see that with three and four-year-olds. No. Um, but then that deer ended up shifting onto the neighbors to the south of me. That's all. And it takes. I didn't catch it quick enough, and that's where I was um, accessing a lot of a lot of the spots, and ended up bumping him another time. So. That could be why too. It's like we just don't see a lot of. Yeah you know, five and six year old deer to be able to study that movement. Sure. But, but I agree. We don't see a ton of consistency in bedding. Uh, the bigger, the bedding area, the more like secured, like that, uh, Jared and Margie stand that I'm talking mm-hmm. about. That's we timbered recently and it's solidified during certain times of the year. I'd say that's fairly predictable. Well, but I think in that same breath, like your bedding areas are like a deer bedding area. Like there are a bunch of deer in those areas. Yeah. I don't see that in, in Southern Ohio. Like I'll no. see it like does and fawns using yep. this, but if there's a buck, like a mature buck, he's, there ain't nobody around him. Mm-hmm. He is in yep. a bed yep. by himself. That's interesting. See, you no, know, ours are very like, w- it's when, more you, social. when you walk into it, yeah, it's like in the middle or towards the back, there will be like a high point, a rise mm-hmm. or something that's really dense and he'll bed right he's there. there. Oh, yeah. I've seen him get up and out of there. Yep. We need to we'll look at that Jared Margie stand. I'm going to make yeah. a slight move. I'm going to kill that deer that co- walked right <laughs> past Corey and I last year. Mm-hmm. He's done. Yeah. As is maybe that three-year-old brow tine deer that they straighten that oh, here. Yeah. Toast. And then around them, you'll see like all these other all does. The small beds. So yeah. dude, it's not uncommon. Like when we pop into one of those stands I'm talking about, mm-hmm. they're typically like on the edge of those bedding areas. Like you're you're in them like yeah. you're you're right in the does like not uncommon at all to get in the tree and look over and oh here, here's a little four I think that's a just walked off man that's tough oh it's yep. challenging but that's why i'm I, you're right on the fringe of coming out of those dead areas that's the sweet spot you can do it though i mean it it it's especially when you have pretty thick cover mm-hmm. blows my mind how tight mm-hmm. you can get with them mm-hmm. i uh or on corn years like dude when we have mm-hmm. corn oh like they just feel it's already a secluded, you know, thick spot and they feel yep. safe there. When I pack it in with, you know, co- like there's a corn crop yeah, there, it's like yeah. you can really feel like they're desolate. They feel like yeah. they're on an island in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. It's yeah. nice. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, that um, where uh, Josiah put that bigger, like two acre plot on the back on side. On the far back. Yep. Mm-hmm. There's a, there's a couple ridges that run off of that. The one ridge on the left, I walked way out that probably a half mile. And then there's a ridge that shoots off to the west. And right at the point of that is there's a giant buck bed. Mm-hmm. And he had just tore that up all this year. But you could tell it's like, it's just him. Mm-hmm. You know, and you could see the beds where he would shift depending yep. on where winds are. Yep. But he's just, it's just matted down at that point and rubs and a couple scrapes around it. And then he's just walking up that, that just essentially coming up a saddle and then he's coming up to the main ridge and then he's taking that up into the property mm-hmm. if there's no disturbance, mm-hmm. you know, and it's like, I mean, you could walk through a mile of timber to set up on him and he'll have no idea. Yeah. Did you guys put in uh, like a road, uh, whatever infrastructure as a part of the, the logging? I'm sure Correct. you had to, yeah, to get in there. But like, did yeah, you- there's, and then we did perimeter access roads basically around the property. Yeah. Um, and That's a lot of that huge, set up really well with years on the topography. It was um, more contour based. Yeah. Um, where we could get on the backside of some hills and stuff, tight mm-hmm. to bedding. Um, yeah. Yep, and just be able killer. to come up in. And from you'll be the able east. to basically come in, just pop up in your blind or whatever you mm-hmm. do there on your food plots and stuff. It's mm-hmm. <laughs> dude, those I, are a those are a big consideration, I think. Not not just I mean, primarily 
primarily for access, uh, but also for for burning. Like if at some point oh, sure. you're going to put a timber, fi- I mean that's that is the point to put your brake. Yeah, in that's there. your brake. Yeah, you can go through with a leaf blower and clear that up. And- I mean, it was huge from an act. The, the only access I had on this property up until this point is I had one small trail I could go behind the cabin, which is still coming from essentially like the east. Um, and I could get up into those, but once I got up in there, I'm on a flat and it's, it's an Oak flat and the major bedding is all around me. So like, Mm -hmm. it's pretty, I mean, you better pop right up into a stand or you're not, nothing's happening. The other one was right up through the gut, which is where all the food was. Mm -hmm. That was it. You you couldn't access that farm prior. I mean, it was like impossible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, there were essentially like when I hunted 130 acres, I hunted two, two spots. Yeah. That's it. That's (laughs) all there were. Yeah, it was literally it two ridiculous, spots. but that's that's yeah. pretty accurate. And it's that's because in and, and those two spots were all within two hundred fifty to three hundred yards from the front of the property. Because the deeper I went, the worse it got. Now I had cam replacements and minerals and stuff in the back, but like couldn't go and, and get buried back in there. Mm. Um and there was a couple, there's one key ridge in there that the uh the neighbor who owned the fifty I talked to at length, and they killed some really good deer. He's like, dude, I'm telling you, he's like, I've sat multiple days first week in november and seen 15 to 20 different bucks around that ridge and it's just because it is you can talk about those like key you know drainages and so, that's what it is it is the key drainage that comes up onto a saddle and it is the main ridge that runs mm-hmm. east and west for miles um and like they just they just run it i mean dude there's spots like that you know it's like i talked about the ones on my farms and yours is going to have the same and we found them in illinois right mm-hmm. it's like Dude, any mature buck that moves into an area, like they, they all have the same mindset as far as how they're going to utilize topography when they're covering ground. Yep. So when you, you figure out how to hunt a farm, like at least during the rut, when movement is happening, you figured out how to hunt the farm. Mm-hmm. Early season and late season, yeah. late season more food tied, but early season is more deer specific. Like that's, mm-hmm. you were probably hunting yep. that deer. You know, so that's, but that's what's cool about the phases of the season mm-hmm. as the sure. transitions through you know yeah. kind of maximize your opportunity there but yeah no i think the you know you mentioned briefly those those access roads in addition to like okay i got money for the timber i create a better habitat we opened up some food plots those access roads are probably the biggest change on that property just to be able to hunt like i could get clear back into the most secluded back corner now which frankly i've got two food plots back there and it's like you know that's where all the deer movement was. I was playing it up front, hoping that they're going to drift their way up there. And it's like, they're not going to do it, at least not during daylight hours. Yeah. Man, that's certainly something to consider. Like wh- when you're looking to buy a farm or, you know, yep. if you're going to do a timber project, I mean, certainly when you're looking to buy, but t- a timber project is maybe your saving grace. Like plan B, if you don't have good access initially, it's like that, mm-hmm. especially the perimeter trails yeah. can give you an opportunity there you do but. need to make sure i mean it kind of comes down i've seen so many guys you know hey just bought this property check out the timber and it's like oh, i'm sorry there's there's just nothing here <laughs> yeah. uh, i mean that happens yeah. a lot and yeah. so you know it's you know educate yourself on what actual you know timber value is and because you know at that point then it's on your own dime to get a dozer in there and do the work which and that I mean, stuff's expensive is, well yes and no i mean it, i mean it's not as bad as what you might think. You can yeah. run a little dozer if you know the right people for relatively cheap. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just a matter of knowing how to operate one. Sure. So. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the key, you know, because when we, so, you know, we had cut um, timber off that 120. We started cutting it off the 50. We added a 66 acre kind of landlock piece on the back. All right. So that is what has completed this farm essentially. And like, clearly, if you look at the farm from an aerial map, it's like there's, one kind of main drainage, which is where the food had historically been and my access, but there's a, an amazing ridge system Mm -hmm. that it's like, man, if you could put food on these ridges and you could use these roads to access it, like, you know, keep that, that main drainage as like the secluded destination grain field. Yep. Like you have a a heck of a setup there. It's the Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Rack Hub. Well, dude, sheds are starting to hit the ground. Yeah, and although we usually don't find many of them, we've done pretty well this season so far. I would say for just, you know, a handful of walks, we've got a pile of sheds to show for it. For, so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Yeah, I mean, if shed season would end today, I think it was pretty successful. So this year, we're partnering with Rack Hub. It's an antler mounting system for your sheds. Yeah, and obviously, people have watched our podcast. We've got this massive pile of sheds that are on the table at all times. But you guys took the time to set up Wide Boy Shed on the R1, which is a really cool way to now have that thing right off to my left-hand side during the podcast. So some of these sheds just call for a little bit more appreciation, I guess. So rather than being up on a pile on the table, you know, we're going to mount them on the wall, and, and they look awesome. So Yeah, and so if anybody wants to try Rack Hub, you can use a 
code HUNTER10, H-U-N-T-R-1-0 at RackHub.com to get 10% off your order. Use RackHub to make the most of your shed season. I was just going to say, I mean, I've, I've talked with a lot of clients over, over the year, this year especially, with it being kind of an off year with, the, with all the acorns and stuff. Um, one of the most successful, you know, scenarios was time and time again, you know, these small secluded clover plots tucked mm-hmm. against bedding. I mean, yeah. that's just deadly. Yeah. yeah, it's not a rocket science. No. Yeah, they're right there. They want to pop. They want to yep. socialize. They want to lay sign. Yep. Mm-hmm. You get that's a picture of them in the morning, slip into their beds. You hop in there in the evening and be right yeah. back out. Man, yeah. you, all, you can almost do a whole series on farms that have that structure. Like, I feel like there's so many of them where it's like, especially in the, you know, not the far northeast, but like southwestern Pennsylvania mm-hmm. into southern Ohio into Kentucky, where it's like, you know, the only access to the property is at the front where there's maybe an old homestead and then there's a, a ditch that runs, be, you know, or a, a lowland where you could plant mm-hmm. the, the ag and then it's just surrounded by a big, uh, you know, ridge and, yep. and timber structure. It's like, how, how do you tackle, how do you tackle that? Especially if it's like Western access, Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, cause then it's like, yeah. it's, it's the epitome of that bull situation we're talking about. It's like, if you're at the property, they smell you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like you're done. I've seen that. So I, I mean, my neighbor, um, Hey Joe, you listen to this. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, he, um, has that similar scenario and it's like, you know, Northwest access. Now he's gotten some permission now from some of the neighbors to access from the South. But one thing there, you know, that you have to watch too, that I've seen in Southern Ohio is, um, it's easy to, to look at your property, see your borders and like, okay, how are the deer going to use only this property? How would I hunt that? Mm-hmm. And you hear, well, hunt the borders. So you just access the borders regardless of, mm-hmm. of what that looks like. And, you know, a lot of times with, with the deer using the topography, um, for instance, you know, the one scenario I can think of was there was a, a field out front, a big drainage that dropped down, and then nice bedding points on this side. But the general movement of the deer was not across this ravine. It was on the ridge tops, sure. and there was bedding just off of this field. And so, you know, there was times he was trying to hunt down, you know, on this side where you're, you're blowing a lot of deer going in. So you have to look at, you know, your property holistically and the properties around you and mm-hmm. actually what the deer are doing, not just your own property. Yeah. And I think that for whatever reason, that always seems harder to people who are in like the the timber country, the, you know, the the rolling hill type areas, um, because it's a lot of times it looks just contiguous, right? Mm-hmm. I think in your area or where we're at in Illinois, like we're forced to look at it beyond our borders, right? Because it's like, literally it's so fragmented that like you're only looking at one or two patches. Like you have to look beyond the borders of like, here's how these deer are going to move. Or I mean, the first thing we looked at on the Illinois farm, we're like, here's the main drainage. Here's spoon river. Here's where our farm is right in between. it's like, yeah, they have to Mm -hmm. come this way. Mm -hmm. Like it just made sense to how that all set up for them to do that. Well, I just do, the more I talk about these different terrain features and you just, I mean, not bragging at all, but like I, we feel good about the fact that we went in and in fact, here, I'll show them off right now while we're, I'm going to talk about this Illinois farm. Oh, flop. Yep. Here's for the guys that are watching the video podcast here. That that's floppy. Here's that big old gnarly eight point that my dad and I shot. That's great the, deer. the third buck we took off that Illinois farm. Um, and what was I going to say? How many, how many total hunts did we put in? Six. Six? six sets. Yeah, like six total hunts and killed three mature bucks. You know, wow. that, that being one of them. Look at the size of the head on that thing. Uh, that's yeah. insane. Yeah. And uh, so, flops. but anyways, I was going to, I was kind of going to go that way and say, you've, you've been out to our Illinois mm-hmm. farm, right? You went yeah. out and walked there. You got some timber business going mm-hmm. in Illinois as well, right? Um, So initially I was planning on, uh, you know, I had a, a lot of people reaching out to me out in that area. And so, you know, I tried to make some connections and stuff. Um. At this point, I have not done anything with it yet, um, mainly because I've been busy enough here locally. And Madison also just had twins, by the way. Yeah, that too. And yeah, twins. That, that and twins. <laughs> nice. Congrats. Congrats. Uh, thank you. Boys or girls? Two girls. Right well, I got three girls under three right now. Oh, oh boy. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so so whenever you need me to hunt your property someday, yeah, <laughs> yeah. just let me know. Um, so the, all that being said, um, yeah, the markets, uh, after doing some more research out there, it, it's a, quite a bit different than in here. I mean, it, it is truly difficult to get rid of your red oak and some of those other species. Mm. Not that it's impossible, but. It's um, primarily walnut and white oak is yeah, the. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you have to be kind of careful what you're buying there. I, I looked at a piece that had um, a lot of red oak on it and it's like, it's, it's tough because, I mean, if, you know, say I own that, I have the access, I could make just 
basically try and just break even to get the timber off to to get the habitat to where I want mm-hmm. it. But you know, as a landowner, it can be tough if you buy a property like that. You know, if it's just wide open and you want to thicken it up, it's not yeah. much you can do really. Can, can you look at uh, you know like we as real estate agents can look at you know comps of properties that mm-hmm. have sold and stuff. Can you do the same with timber sales? You say, hey, here here's a timber sale that happened here recently. Here's what was on it, and here's what they got for it. Um, I mean. For myself here, it's just because I know so many people, you know, I'm, it's not, not There's like not anything's a public posted, database no, or anything. nothing like that that mm. I'm aware of. And if, I mean, there is, but it's, it's a year behind. Gotcha. Right. Which I suppose, you Which, know, that, that'd be cool just to know, uh, as far as like from a neighborhood standpoint, what happened where, but mm-hmm. you can just default to like the price per board foot and make Correct. your own deductions. Yeah. But, but was, even that, you know, varies. Cause I mean, from, for instance, you had three properties there and each one was a different price per board foot because of the structure of the makeup of the timber. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The what, timber itself. What the average came yep. down to. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, but, I mean, you can't necessarily compare neighbors to neighbors and mm. say, I'm going to have the exact same amount per board. Foot. And I assume like topography and ease of accessing the timber stuff has um, something to do with it. Yes. Distance, uh, the distance is a bigger issue. Yeah. Yep. That's what we, if there was a struggle with our property, it was distance to. Mill. Yeah. If your property would have been, um, what do we average on, on the main? Was it like 40, 42, 43? 43? Yeah. So like that would have probably brought over 60 cents yeah. board foot further north. Yeah, it was a long a long drive. I right. forget what they were saying in terms of cost on it's like it's six, just in, it's 6 insanity. or 700 bucks yeah. cost per uh, Well, it's it's at least that 7 yeah. 800 dollars. Yeah, wow. per, per per load, load out. out. That's incredible. I was curious about that Boy Scout property that sold out in Illinois cuz it, it that they had all the black walnut on it. Well, Bobby <laughs> Bobby yeah. said that he thought there was probably, you know, almost 100 in black walnut on it. Now whether wow. that was all yeah, you well, know, ready to go or not. We never walked it, but just from the pictures, I was like, I thought we remembered seeing a lot of red oak. That's why it was kind of came to mind as he was talking about that. I mean, it had a lot of walnut on it. Wow. Yeah, at least from the pictures. Because that's that was the immediate thing. It's like, there's a lot of walnut. I think they relisted it for sale, right? Didn't we see that come back up? I think they cut it, and then they relisted right, it. Right, right, <laughs> Yeah. Bobby didn't buy it, right? Somebody else no, did. No, somebody, it was an auction. Somebody else outbid him. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, well, you, you know, and we can talk freely about it. I mean, you know, we had you come out and look at our Illinois piece mainly, and this is where it, it's, Sorry. you know, if we look <laughs> at, if we look at how you're kind of, um, visualizing your property, it, it's tough because obviously for Jared and I, it's like, that's a hunting property, mm-hmm. but it's also an investment property. So yeah. like, I don't necessarily want to cut the timber off just for habitat. Like I'd like to make some investment mm-hmm. back mm-hmm. on that side. And so we've got a lot of walnut on that property. Um, but some of it's younger. You yeah. know, it could yeah. use time, basically. Yeah. Well, what do you think about that? Jeremy's always, you know, if, if he and I are going to sit somewhere <laughs> on it, he, he always thinks the deer's older, a year older than it, yeah. I think it is, right? <laughs> yeah. And so he always thinks the timber's better than I think it is. Like, yeah. I recall, granted, we've only walked through that one section of timber one, once, one time in the summer. And I remember there being walnuts. Mm-hmm. Nothing that I was like, this is a giant straight walnut tree. Yeah, I mean... Maybe a few yeah. like that, but not overwhelmingly. Yeah, so, I mean, really you had the, as you go back, the main draw of CRP there on the left-hand side yeah. back up in there. That, that's that's the that main big, chunk. Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, there might be a handful scattered throughout the rest of the property along the creeks and stuff, but not much. Um, and back there, yeah, there was a handful that were actually pretty nice that, you know, would make veneer and would bring pretty good money. Um, you would have to cut it pretty aggressively to to get um any you know significant return on it Mm -hmm. um, would be my opinion um which we would do because of the habitat mm -hmm. mindset yep as well well what is your opinion like if you were to say purely from an income standpoint would you wait or would you cut it um purely from an income standpoint so i was thinking about that property and so i mean i buy and sell some properties as well so i'm always looking at okay by taking this timber off am i going to be hurting the value of the property Mm -hmm. Um, and something, you know, I'm kind of weighing on is, is if it's, you know, a big, you know, say a property like your Southern Ohio piece, Mm -hmm. that's going to probably affect the value short term of the property more so than, you know, out in Illinois there, you got one little corner that has some timber in it. You can cut that out. I don't really think you're going to hardly see any difference. Primarily a recreational property. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and there's a lot more. I mean, you're not buying that for that little corner of woods. No. Right? Um, you're buying it for the, the topography, the CRP, the different elements of that property. Yeah, running through it. Um, and so, you know, something like that, I wouldn't be as concerned about taking timber off. I did If a, I was going to flip it out yep. back for sale. I did gotcha. a 38-acre uh, piece in Kershocht and similar scenario. It was eight acres of timber. Um, yeah. And, like, the person buying that, you know, while the, 
this little section of timber is nice. That's not the main reason you're buying that property. Correct. So I wasn't too worried about cutting that out. Mm-hmm. Whereas I did a West Virginia property and that was all wooded. Um, I did an extremely light harvest to the point that you would hardly notice you were in there. Mm-hmm. Um, just to to make sure the resale on that mm-hmm. is good. Mm-hmm. I do think, uh, and I want to, I think, go more in depth with, to get a real answer from mm-hmm. you out on that. But uh, one one thing per what we've been talking about that does seem like it would be to our advantage there, whether we would use it or not, just to, just to harden up the line and and allow us to patrol our border and stuff a little better. Is it seems like we would really benefit from a road put in on that northern and eastern border of mm-hmm. that block of timber. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm talking yep. about? Yep. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's a pretty strong argument to push for some sort of a, a timber harvest that in and of itself doesn't justify it. But as far as the size of the trees and stuff and like where it's going in the yeah. next like five years, like I think as of right now, Jeremy and I tossed out the idea there were, you know, and, and even now, if, so, if I don't know, if if the, mm-hmm. the if the most amazing farm in Kansas popped out to us and somebody made us an offer, we couldn't refuse, then sure, mm-hmm. you know, everything's for sale. Mm-hmm. But for right now... I just think we can't walk away. There's too much potential. Like yep. we, we've got food going in on the property this year, negotiated a four acre standing oh, uh, grain. Dude, that's game changer. <laughs> uh, contract with the farmer and stuff. we got yep. screens going everywhere. We're going to put a couple of box blinds on it this mm-hmm. year. Like mm-hmm. we, we, it's a, it's yep. a banger, yep. right? Yep. And, uh, so that being the case, I'm just like, waiting on my invite. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and so the longer we, the longer we have it, like, you know, the longer we're likely to keep it, I think. So sure. like right now we're probably yeah. in a three to five year yeah. time mm-hmm. frame, maybe. Yep. And, uh, so, yeah, so the question becomes, like, with that time frame in mind, yep. I'm always thinking, I don't want to cut it and then sell it the next year. That yeah. doesn't yep. look great. Yep. Mm-hmm. Maybe it doesn't affect our farm as much as, yep. like you said, Jerry's right. Ohio. Well, which, you know, on that side, like, my knowing I was going to cut that, you know, Emily and I had talked, my plan was to hold it for at least three years, mm-hmm. you know, yep. so that, like, it, you know, it can start to regenerate, everything <clears throat> starts to look, you know. To be honest, your, your property is going to look better quicker than I thought it would. Yeah. In what sense? What do you mean? Well, I mean, it was in some areas, um, it was not... His Ohio farmer? Correct. Yeah, the Ohio farmer. Yeah, I was just saying, I think that thing's going to bounce back quicker than what I initially thought it might. Just Um, because of the selectiveness in some of those areas? Yeah, some of those areas, you know, didn't get cut quite as hard as we initially thought. Just got a few trees dropped and dragged out, so it's not as tore up. So, I mean, there's there's areas there that I think, and there's a lot of good looking, you know, 12 to 16 inch white oaks in Mm -hmm. there. Um, and those really explode after a harvest. But uh, back to your Illinois farm. Um, so especially on walnut, um, if you don't have to cut them, I would wait. And the reason being, you know, similar to a stock or something, you have a compounding effect. Mm-hmm. As that diameter of that tree grows, you have more board feet in that tree, and they're also worth more per board foot. Sure. And so, and it's it's way more dramatic on a on a walnut right. and a white oak than it would be on a hard maple or a red oak. Got okay. it. What do you think, uh, do you think there's work to be done in the timber in the meantime? Like, do you think we could go in and benefit those with like some TSI or something? Yeah. So there's quite a bit of, uh, just junk in there. Yeah. I saw um, some like hackberry. Yeah. Maybe. A lot of hackberry, a lot of, um, yeah, just, just trash in there. What's, and what is hackberry? It's the one that's got like, like buckthorn? The, yeah. No, uh, no, it, it's, it's a bigger tree, but it's got kind of squirrely bark almost. It's hard to describe. It looks like little bumps all mm-hmm. over it. Okay. Going um, but a lot of that stuff you could go in and release <laughs> some of those. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. That's a 12 year old in me, like Nick Sweeter. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you could go in and release some of those walnuts Sorry. and get some more growth a little quicker. Um, and then on top of that, a lot of that stuff shoots a lot of stems per acre when mm-hmm. you cut yeah. it down as far as shoots on your, for, for more brows. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that would definitely benefit in those areas. Cause there's some thick spots in that, um, that and, pocket as it sits. And to be frank, I think that would benefit you more on the bedding than an actual timber harvest would. I agree. Um, the walnuts in general, they don't take up a lot of ground. Like, um, cause I mean, you'll see them, you'll, these big walnuts in these thick, nasty areas. Mm-hmm. They're the first to lose leaves or the last to put them on yeah. and they don't take up that much canopy space. Yeah. They're not going to blow um, a giant crown so you're, out. To me, I'm, I think you're really looking at it strictly from a return standpoint mm-hmm. of when you want to do it. Hmm. Do you think Jeremy and I could handle that on our own? Do you think those trees are identifiable enough or in pockets oh, yeah. or yeah. there's, I mean, other than the walnut, there's nothing in the there. The alternative being like, w- would you want to come out or will have Ben come out and yeah, mark those for us? Yeah, gladly come out and, you know, help you with that. But we're probably too far into it this year, but that'd be something this winter yeah. we, we consider mm-hmm. going in and mm-hmm. just taking a, a trip. You well, know? we yeah. knew we, when we walked in there last summer, we walked up on one of those high point knobs in there and it was clearly like a bachelor group had been betting yeah. there. Like, well, when I walked, when I walked it, there was yeah, you half kicked a dozen out a bucks bunch. in there. Yeah. There was what? Half a dozen bucks in there. 
Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That you kicked out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Those are the ones that we would see dive out of the top into that cut cornfield a lot. Well, we need to secure our borders. Like, you know. Oh, really? <laughs> okay, Trump. <laughs> as much as possible. Yeah. Much like what we're experiencing here in the U.S. Like, we just got to. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in a bit of a wall. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And like, we can't obviously put, I mean, you could put a fence there, but we're not going to do yeah. that. Like what? It's crossed my mind. <laughs> so we're trying internally, fence, we're trying internally fence. to, yeah, just, just structure the farm in a way mm-hmm. that keeps them, you know, in, in our borders. So just yep. as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Or at least if it was like in that block, m- not to interrupt you, like Sorry. more funneled. Like mm-hmm. the, the problem is, is because that block hasn't been timber harvest and how like those deer just like, you know, ooze out of every nook and cranny of that, that 20 acre block of timber. Mm-hmm. Is it if, even that big? Yeah. I think it's 23 acres. Maybe. Okay. Gotcha. Um, but if you, if you had more control on how that funnel, like if they were only coming through the pinch of pinches, or if they were only coming through up at that top, it's going to limit how they blow across those fields, which is, you know, it, it's one thing in archery or, or how that's, how that's going to happen. It's different <clears throat> when those deer are running for their lives and they're just blown out of the woods yeah. and, and breaking field. Like if they were in two more concentrated points, it would probably be a lot more restrictive. So, I mean, I think this is my opinion. What I would do in that scenario, you can rent a skid steer for pretty cheap, you know, with like a mulcher head and a uh, brush grapple. Yeah. Um, go in there and, you know, put a little bit of a perimeter road in there. And then, you know, because you're going to... I do think that helps. I you're think, gonna have I a think lot that of, alone, they see that as a line. They're like, let me just wait till dark. And yeah. then on top of that, you know, you've got enough junk in there that you can cut them. that you can pretty easily yeah. stack them. They hate, they do not like a wall. I've seen some guys, you know, they'll they'll take, they'll clear out a food plot and just put a wall around it mm-hmm. and just have them two points of entry and, and the deer won't go the, in there. Yeah, no, the, they don't yeah. like that at all. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's, a, you know, something a deer will avoid you know, I think that would push them more onto your side, having that there. Mm-hmm. Hmm. You don't want to make them too enclosed or feel too, too boxed into the point that they don't really want to bed in there at all. Sure. But, um, I think you could, you could help yourself. Well, <laughs> it'll also be interesting this year. Cause last year was standing corn up until mid November, basically on that farm to the north. Um, okay, gotcha. and then, so this year it'll all be standing mm-hmm. beans. That beans will be gone. I mean, it'll look barren around there and we mm-hmm. will have, Finally, like stall, uh, tall standing native warm season grasses that are not mowed. We hope. Uh, we <laughs> hope. Um, so, like, we, we've got a lot of things working from a cover standpoint. That said, it's still 140 acres. These deer are going to venture out, yeah. uh, you know, I'll, off the property. I'll tell you what, Jerry. Well, you and I need to figure out, again, maybe roping some some experts on this. It's like, I'm, sh- I'm struck. As much as I want to agree, and I did at one time with having that a food plot closer to the road there, mm-hmm. I just, I can't understand how we can hunt that with uh with the west wind yeah i was gonna say you have west access on that do you know what i mean and it's just like it would literally be like a hundred yard trail to a box blind with a plot uh, right you have the river coming down there you could have it down kind of along the river and blow your wind if you had a northwest and blow it kind of down towards the house Yeah, if we just dropped into that creek where they're coming from some of those big boxes like right on the road gotcha Okay. Yeah, they bed right, wow. right on that would, creek we there. We would catch them coming like right at dusk, and it's like this deer had to be bedded like between the road and like our soybean field, which See, was that's nothing. just so foreign, you know, from what I'm yeah, used to hunting. It is. They, you know, these little fence lines that you have deer bedding in and stuff. It's just completely because we were like, oh, okay, here's where they're all bedded, yep. and like uh, four nights in a row, it's like. Dude, that tear's laying like yeah. right here behind. He's like, we were joking. He was in bed with Carl, basically. Fl- fl- <laughs> floppy was. We, we'd get pictures yeah. of him at last light coming from like the road. We literally thought we're like, dude, wow. he's like feeding them apples in the backyard or something. This deer is like right there all the I'm time. I'm pretty confident I bumped a big buck walking into that uh, that brassica stand, that creek bottom mm-hmm. stand there. Just, he was, they lay right there. Well, so here's my argument for it. So num- number one, here's the struggle I'm having is like, what wind? They even, I mean, Okay, so you see, yeah. you just ha- have a box blind and like keep it as enclosed. But dude, the minute you open it, like any west wind at all is blowing in the direction. Yeah. So you just wait for east winds, maybe. But I mean, few and far between. How often do you get? And them? and when you do get one, it's swirling. Well, and I'll, so there you go. I'll give you that. If if you know, if we can look back and say, hey, there's enough east winds here to justify something like that. Okay, okay, maybe. Mm-hmm. On the flip side, we had three mature bucks. Two of them we killed walk in front of us at that pinch of pinch. Oh, that's a deadly spot on any north wind. Yeah. And it's accessible. It's not the best. We could we, we can could, make it better. We can yeah. make it better. Putting a road down there would help a lot. You know, and and the the reason I think we're talking about moving away is because of the neighboring it's closer to a line. Mm-hmm. Which I don't mind my scent blowing back into his property. Oh. 
No, I don't mind. And that guy's just gun hunting. Yeah. So it's yeah, it's that's like yeah. a few times a Which year. Which they killed two this year. Mm-hmm. I think oh, a ten yeah. and an eight. Yep. Off of there. Yep. Um granted, you know, maybe that's a small sample size. Like, dude, we have a lot of mature bucks. So like and there it's I know they're not passing these deer. No. So there's evidence that they can survive. It was it was a small it's one of the thickest properties in several thousand Did you see acre that area. Pinch, pinch stand? I didn't see the extra. Uh, when you walk the CRP all the way back, it's on the right hand side. You put yes. a muddy yep. up in there. Right? That's where we killed that guy. Yeah, there's a. Do you come in? Do you cross the creek? No, we come in where I got you on camera, dropping yep. down the hill. We drop straight down over that hill to the top, and we stop right before the creek and get up in. Oh, it's on this side. Coming of the from the right away. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Nice. Yep. So yep. that's it's where I killed mine at the first night. I, I did a hang and hunt with a lone wolf there, and then Jared and his dad killed this one. They're during open day gun. Yep. And they both, Jeremy's come down out of that uh, b- block of timber. I, had you're so talking many, about. I saw so many bucks that night. Every time I'd rattle, a buck would come out of there. Every freaking time. <laughs> wow. And, but he was getting downwind because we had a west wind and it was getting squirrely in that that creek. And mm. so they a few of them caught me. He came straight down out, though, and he didn't mm. catch. Did you walk to the north? There's that uh, finger timber that runs up through the center of the property. There's a little opening in there, a little food plot we have in there. Uh, I did not get to that little corner there, no. Okay. Right. Uh, I basically walked the main chunks, the the back corner where the walnut was at, uh, down where you caught me on camera, that main mm-hmm. section there. Oh, right there's how we access that. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. There's a few decent white oaks and stuff in that little 10-acre patch there on that side. Yeah, a lot of them are real big, nasty, yeah, like nasty trees like, where there's not, yeah, not, tree not a whole lot of... Uh, board feed in them. Yeah, um, it's almost like a property line tree. Yeah, exactly. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Sever. Well, one of the biggest things that we always talk about is what our arrow setups are. And this year we're shooting the Sever broadheads. I think we're both shooting the new two inch titanium broadhead. And so, you know, we're huge proponents of expandables. And I know we've had this argument back and forth with people, but we just- We're we, right and you're wrong. And that's, you just need to accept it. We just want to have <laughs> a giant wound that pumps out blood. That's the bottom line. We build our arrow setups and shoot bows, you know, f- to maximize penetration. And we shoot broadheads that are going to give us the best blood trails, you know, the most hemorrhage possible. Uh, and so part of those setups is we're also shooting the Eastern arrows here coming up pretty soon. So we've, yep. we've shot the victory in the past mm-hmm. and you know, there's all kind of great arrow shafts on the market, but like we're looking for a whole system from broadhead to arrow components to the arrow shaft itself. And uh, you know, the more we look at some of these Eastern shafts and the components that go with them, that setup's going to be really deadly for us. Yeah. I'm actually using the Easton traditional axis right now uh, in my traditional setups for both my recurve and my longbow. I've got a hundred grain brass insert on those and then obviously i'm using a fixed blade broadhead on on those specific shafts right on so but yeah our goal is always to be shooting the best broadhead that we think is going to be the most lethal for our setups we've done plenty of research we believe in the sever broadheads and we hope you would check them out at sever broadheads as well what are your thoughts on like small patches of of walnuts um i was going to ask you about that little food plot where i killed that other buck there's the only tree, you know, there's like a small pocket of just like young walnuts, mm-hmm. which, which we don't, ha- I don't. Town in the honey hole? Yeah. Those ones that are like 10 feet tall or whatever? Uh-huh. Yeah, it's they're young. Mm-hmm. They almost look planted. You oh, know? gotcha. I don't know. Yeah, they look, I don't know if they are. Because they're just but. like, nothing else is that young around in a, in a group like so that. So I guess here's the question. Like, I'd love just for, uh, you know, you have in your mind how you want a food plot to be shaped. You're like, man, I... I should just wipe these out here. And, oh, you know, it's like, are they worth keeping? Like, you know, um, especially so, knowing that they put off like a toxin at some point, like, can we even have a little food right. plant on there? Um, the walnut grow pretty slow in general. Um, so it would be, I mean, if you're looking at five years, you're not going to see a return on those sure. in that amount of time. So, I mean, you know, it kind of comes down to, you know, the landowner basically on that. I mean, it's, if it's where the plot needs to be, then I would probably opt to just, clear it and put the plot in there other guys would probably disagree i don't know it's just they're they're kind of closing in on and it's not like we absolutely have to have this yeah. food here there's enough there i mean but yeah it was kind of the question it's that just I a had. natural opening there um what do you think you know as far as he's saying like well i don't because they are very young trees it's uh-huh. like, that's where i have the cameras you're on talking about them. being are open talking oh. like this big or this big that big yeah okay yeah, once they get to that size, like, man, you know, they made it that far. That right? you kinda, <laughs> yeah, probably. Kind of, I don't know. I, Are you, you just always... talking about opening up the food plot more? Yeah. I think from where you're sitting, it's kind of around the point anyways. Like, I don't think it's going to make a huge difference there. 
I mean, because it's we just put no, some it clo- won't make a huge just difference. put some clover and rye in there. It's literally just a small kill plot. Yeah, that's yeah. all it is. There is a no brainer. I don't know why there's that section like right in front of you. Mm-hmm. That's like yeah, we can well, let's open that up. Yep. a little bit more, but yeah, okay, yeah. I was just curious your thoughts mm-hmm. on that. They also didn't use that fence jump as much as I thought they would right there under the stand. Just probably well, we a caught good thing. floppy like one of the first pictures we caught a floppy was right there. It was the first picture. Um but other than that like it it's a defined jump that would go into the neighbor's property and they mm-hmm. it looked like they would use it all the time and they do not. You just come right down that track. It's mm-hmm. just like we also have a bunch of turkeys on that and it, like Really? Don was like yeah there's like hardly any turkeys around here. There's strutters all over the place on that thing. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. Couple anyways, yeah. Mhm. We're you gonna make that. it out, huh? You're gonna make it out? Probably not. <laughs> not for sure. <laughs> Unless we picked up. You want to go shoot one? Or not? Uh, yeah. By all means, I don't know. Yeah, if I'll make it out. Go, go, go see. Them. Go see if our tenant's still alive. There you go. <laughs> the easiest way. To I go. got one of those too. <laughs> <laughs> the easiest way to get on one of uh, mine and Jared's properties, but like, hey, can I go shoot a turkey? I don't go shoot yeah, it. absolutely. Yes, you can. <laughs> go ahead. It's fine. Care. Whatever. Uh, don't funny. you find a shed? Leave it. Yeah. Don't touch it. Just mark it. Yeah. Um. No, I do think that you know each property kind of has its own, you know little twist to that and and you know it also depends on what's your final goal from uh you know holding it long term mm-hmm. hunting standpoint investment standpoint and it's tough man it's a you know especially when you took a talk about the ebb and flows of the the timber market too yep you know we kind of walked into it on a on a good market you know and and given that you were heavy to white oak yeah yep. you know so I, I think that's a that's a tough thing for people and and a lot of people listen to this you know if you're in northern wisconsin or northern pennsylvania like you might be harvesting like soft maples and stuff and it's like there's a market there for that you know and we don't have one of those Mm -hmm. so it's you know that i think is the hardest part when we when we talk to people i'm sure you got a lot of calls on the last one it's being able to have a conversation it's like listen man like where you're at i don't know like that market's going to be so different every which way you're at like if you're talking about where we're at and where we're cutting that's one thing you know, but so, in these other places, it makes it so hard. So I've worked with a few guys out of state and stuff, you know, down in Kentucky and uh, actually a guy out in Illinois as well that, you know, basically hit me up and, you know, we were kind of coaching them through the process and stuff. And it kind of ends up being a lot of those areas, you know, you're doing cuts on shares, yeah. um, especially on a smaller track. Yeah. What was so, it? Cuts on what? Shares. Basically, you know, a 50-50 split or a 60-40, whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Versus um, whatever it is on the... So are they still paying that up front? No. Most of that's paid on the back end because yeah. a lot of it... What ends up happening is, um, you know, a lot of these mills will specialize in a couple species. For example, down in Southern Ohio, you have graft uh, would be specializing in white oak. Mm. And so they'll buy standing timber, but it has to be 60, 70% white oak. Um, and so, you know, for example, there might be a property down there that might have 15% white oak. They're not going to be interested in that, but a logger can go in and source out these different buyers for each species. So what they'll go, you know, they'll go in and cut it. And a lot of these are smaller operations. Mm-hmm. They don't have the capital to pay for the timber up front. They'll go, you know, mark the timber, cut it, drag it out, and then have buyers come in for each different species that are cut up um, for whatever they need in that area. Okay. And so you don't have buyers come in for the white oak, buyers come in for the walnut, buyers come in for this and that. And then, you know, when everything's said and done, then you split the profits. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. And to be clear, a 50-50 split would be on the gross revenue of the timber. So 50% of the gross revenue of the timber would go to you, 50, re- remaining 50 would go to the logger, and then out of their 50, then they have to cover their own expenses. Got that it. makes sense. Yep, that makes sense. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I, I guess I kind of go back and just tell people, I'm like, listen, if you can identify white oak and walnut and you've got it, like, that's probably decent timber. <laughs> yeah. Like, so are you coming over into our part of the state very much then here in uh, Pennsylvania? Um, <clears throat> I've I've looked at a few in green down here. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I did um, Jared's. Yeah, Pooja's. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, did you guys take, a, take timber off of it? It's not been cut yet. It'll be cut here as soon as it's dry enough. Is that a good one? Yeah, it's good timber. That's yep. awesome. Dude, the first time I walked it, I was like, dude. And he yeah. was one of those guys. He's like, oh, I could never cut the timber yeah, off. And yeah, I'm like, yeah. you have to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. He's It It freaks him out a little bit, but I think he'd be all right. He's already um, got a d- good deer hunting place. That's going to take it up a notch. Did he sure. come out and hunt your place this year? Yeah, he was on my property for a little bit. Yep. Did he kill one? He didn't. No, we, there was a buck. He was in there after, and he had him come in. And I got, unfortunately, one of those like 
cheap Amish made blinds in there, mm-hmm. and the windows are absolute crap on it. Mm. And I didn't know cheap and Amish went together. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, he you know tried to get the get the window open on it and bust it off. So uh-huh. got pretty close, but <laughs> I remember because he's public land dude. I remember yeah. him telling me like this is he's like this is amazing. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you. The world. He's like I could eat a candy bar in here. It was crazy. <laughs> uh, cracks me up. That's he told me he used to just buy my other property down in Athens. So. So, yeah, we'll sell his timber, and you probably can afford to. Yeah, you just bought one in Megs with me, right? It is in Megs. Yeah, yeah, correct. Yep, that one mm-hmm. right down the road. Yep. Yeah. Yep. See what's on it. I'll probably sell that one. I haven't decided yet. Either late summer or mm-hmm. wait till after the season's over. Is there yes. timber on that one? Uh, very little. A lot of it, and it, it honestly would make a really good building lot. But it also you had more open ground on that one. Yeah, right? had quite a bit of open open ground on there. So I'm putting mm-hmm. in some beans and clover plot and stuff, and then screening stuff in. There you go. So, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, I've been told by a few people that area is really good. So I don't know. It seems so funny, man. That uh, you know, Megs, Athens, you know, Washington. Did, did uh, Higgins sell down there yet? I think his. They have his, the auction. That was over in Washington, further east. That one sold. Yeah. 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 He didn't bring very much. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Bummer. Yeah. He cut a lot of timber off mm-hmm. of that. I think that was probably why. Yeah, um, he opened up a lot of that ground. I think guys are getting more, not that they weren't before, but they're, you know, privy to that. It's like, even we went out to Illinois and saw some stuff. It's like, you know. Well, I mean, how many guys are willing, like, let's even say in Southern Ohio, how many guys want to spend $4,500 an acre on just hunting ground, like no investment value yeah. whatsoever? That's a well, tough pill to swallow. Especially I, when you don't know the quality of the hunting on it. Sure. I bet they would be more inclined to if there wasn't bare stumps, you know, mooning them in the face well frankly that's one of the reasons that i i told her when we cut i was like i'm holding this for at least three more years that's so kind of that how i feel have about that it. yeah it's like don't down. you know are you coming or going you know what i mean it's like don't just like it's a be like, be like oh here you go and then just oh actually mm-hmm. here's what you got i mean you we've seen we've all probably looked at listings where it's just logging roads and cuts <laughs> yeah. and you're just like you know Looks the like property crap. might be great may, yeah. maybe producing giants but just the look the aesthetic look of it you're like oh. yeah well, well even that, even the piece i hunt uh like i said it's 50 some acres and it's like doesn't look that great to be honest I yeah mean, it's cut pretty hard yeah if i didn't know now obviously i mean topography wise it sets up beautifully mm-hmm. yep. but like if i didn't know what type of deer on that property and the and the quality of the hunting i don't know if i would be that interested sure. in buying it it but. is subjective to i mean obviously but as far as like uh, what's going to influence the opinion, it's like when I look at big timber stuff, like I can acknowledge its beauty just for like yeah, it's aesthetic how old pleasing. the trees are and stuff. But when I look at like a clear cut ridge and stuff, or like it, jungle, that gets me going just because yeah. I know what's possible. I know the deer, yeah. the deer, you know, aspect. That's and tied I think you're to having it. more and more of those buyers that are aware of that <clears throat> and the benefits of cutting and are mm-hmm. more more willing to buy pieces. Um, but you still have. A lot of, I mean, this is just my opinion, but I feel like the majority of, of the land is investors. Well, that's land. what I was I mean, going to, it's, it's, even the hunters are starting to think, they have to think that way, yeah. right? I mean, you have to look at that. There is going to be an appreciation on just the recreational value. As long as deer mm-hmm. are there, the demand is high, it's going to happen. But like you, whether it's oil and gas or it's timber or it's CRP or it's crops, like you want to, you know, feel good about you're buying something that can make some money mm-hmm. there's a there's a cap on it though you want to talk real quick about it? you saw whose farm is still on the market yeah winky's old, old one. winky's old farm the old albia mm-hmm. farm listed it for what they buy Almost it for a couple years ago i say four i thought it was three something maybe a four million it's on the market right now for like six four six nine i think six nine yeah it's just like it's an offensive price it's like yeah. f you for thinking it's worth that yeah <laughs> yeah i mean it's, but that's i mean dude that is can you name a more famous farm like a more highly sought after more history more probably not you know and so there there's your cap on Mm -hmm. what people are willing to pay for a wreck a wreck farm yeah and And it's probably got timber value and farm income and stuff too i'm sure it does i mean it's it's probably got some jeremy's like no i cut them all down (laughs) i cut all the walnuts down yeah no i mean he he did select cut that thing hard yeah um like he was doing well you heard him on midwest way he would timber stand and prove that thing all the time you know some of the best places he kills his bucks i mean if you looked at it it's just a big thicket ridge Mm -hmm. you know with some spotty oaks i'm sure there still is some good timber on there but even still like uh, you know i don't know what that's bringing cash rent it's probably not a lot um you know like it's iowa how how much of it is uh ag is farmed oh thousand acre farm right yeah maybe three or four hundred yeah and they're probably paying uh 
I mean, should, out, should out be there's got to be in there. 200 an acre. I'm sure there's CRP. I think it might be sub 200 out there. Really? Mm. Um, I'm sure it's paying some CRP areas. Like You putting in for Iowa? No, I haven't uh, yet. Should. No points? No, not at all. Dude. I know. I need to. Got to get started. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, so I don't know. I mean, it, it, but it is one of those ones where it's like, yeah, there's, there's a cap. I mean, you know, it, if the income offset that, then it would make sense, right? Like that was a huge advantage of our Illinois one. And it's like, man, we're going to make $20,000 a year on CRP basically, yeah. you know? And it's like, yeah, that doesn't pay all the bills, but like sure makes it a heck of a Helps. lot more attractive. Well, it nullifies some of that, uh, uh, interest. interest that we're paying. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And again, like whether it's this year or next year or 2025, what, whatever, like the, the ultimate thing is, is that at some point interest rates will come down. They're going to, people are going to yell at me because I say that all the time, but they're going to come down. They will. Well, they have already. They've started. Yeah. Well, and I mean the, the feds just as this last meeting said, they're going to do, they're still on track to do three cuts this year. Mm-hmm. So by the time we get to the end of this year, Jared and I could refinance that Illinois farm at a much lower rate for a $500 rate lock. Um, than where we're at now, you know, and that might save eight, nine hundred thousand dollars a lot. month. Yeah, that's a significant amount of money back in pocket. How much? Sorry, you said eight, nine hundred thousand. Eight, <laughs> nine hundred thousand. How yeah. much could it save us per month? Up to th- probably up to a thousand dollars a month. Nice. Yeah. yeah when huge. I refinance my new Kentucky property, I got in it bad. Mm-hmm. I got in it like eight seven, mm-hmm. and I refinanced it at six and a quarter. I think it saved me almost eight hundred bucks a month. Wow. wow. It's a lot of money back in my pocket. Yeah, it's huge. You know, and again, it's not like we're talking about money on the principal. We're talking about pure interest, yep. which sucks. Man, it's been a it's been a good experience so far. Buying, I mean, we've had that gun season thing was interesting, and like, the, you know, it, we'll see how that develops moving you still forward. Have nightmares from it. It was just, <laughs> I, yeah, it was pretty nuts. But but looking back on it, even as we were consider, you know, we like I said, we did that podcast a couple. We used to go about considering selling, and I'm like, dude, there's a lot of reasons to keep it. You know, yeah. I mean, it's like how many mature bucks came through there. The fact that we killed three. Well, we'll have, uh, we'll apply. We'll get two bow tags this year as non residents. I know, I'm which so is jealous. that's that's a big one. Last year we didn't have it. We had that's why you shot this during gun season. Is we had two buck tags, but only one bow, one gun. Now we'll have our non resident. I kind of can't one. believe this one happened. It was like we were already, you know, pretty. I mean, I guess Kansas kind of had me down because it was like sucked. Like, yeah. Dragon. Just our weather was tough and we were. Uh, it's the right move to go up there, though. Locked down and stuff. And then, yeah, for this to come together, like with dad in a stand. And mm-hmm. that's that's the. Was that the main deer you were after? Yeah. That's the primary We had been trying to buy. kill that deer for the entire <laughs> season. Well, there were several, you know, of these just big old eights yeah. that we would have shot. We shot had shot two of them uh, leading up to this. And mm-hmm. then this was the primary resident. I would mm-hmm. say he was, he had been there since September, August time frame, And it's prob- amazing when you take probably the like oldest that out, too. just the opening that creates. Yeah. There's one more. Bottom. We call him crazy horse. That is a hoss. Well, dude, a crazy horse. Who knows that deer could blow up. Like yeah. he's probably ancient now, but you never know. Like yeah. freaking this deer right here. Yeah. You know, they could, he could have a good year. Crazy yeah. horse needs to come out. And then I, we didn't really see that, uh, the G double G four buck anymore. Remember him? We could try to come. That's the one you saw in the morning when you were pulling your bow up still or yeah. whatever. Yeah. He, oh, we saw him after. Did we? Yeah. I didn't deer, think we saw him after gun se- yeah. I don't think we saw him after gun season though. He's out there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I sense his presence. <laughs> he, he that's that if he is, he and that other tight rack four year old mm-hmm. would be our two primary management bar- mm-hmm. bucks to target, mm-hmm. I think. And uh, yeah, that uh, crazy that G four buck is a real piece of shit. Yeah, <laughs> he, he he also we thought he was he's like, cool. He's ancient. He's just like a he's just stacked, just stacked. you know. But is he can't be but one hundred and twenty inches. Oh, yeah, gotcha. he's just a tight eight, and he's got like baby G fours trying to poke out. That's mm-hmm. funny. Um, but yeah, I mean, all crazy of those horse bucks, could do something good. And dude, there's there's quite a few bucks that we just didn't see a whole lot. But like in that early November time, they were came cruising through. hard. Yeah, dude, that big heavy eight. Could really be something. What the kickers? Mick Jagger yeah. could still be out there, possibly. Possibly. I'm curious with the mild winter if that's going to make make the deer have potentially a better jump going Boy, into I'll the spring. T- better, I'll tell you what, sure it can't help hurt. They for sure yeah. held antlers longer this year. Oh my god! Like, yeah. I mean, there's. I've still got bucks holding. Yeah. Yep. It's Have crazy. Night, both most sides. of most of my mature ones have dropped, but I've still got you know two year olds, yeah. three year olds holding. Then I'm like, what are you doing? Drop them. Dude, yeah, I, and then I got other deer that got nubs this big already. Wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Dude, I got a buck setting scrapes quite a bit still. I mm-hmm. Those I, community scrapes I, are I, I don't know what's wrong with me. Like, in years past, I've just, like, 
it's like you know about scrapes and you but it's like you focus you, it's really focus on october yeah dude i have had so much consistency on like not all this field edge, no, not field edge scrapes and uh -huh. stuff. But when you identify those, like if you're going to call them community scrapes or primary scrapes, it's like t to this day, this morning, I've got bucks hitting them, mm. just tearing into them. You know what I'm stoked about is there's a box of six uh, non cell DS4Ks uh, yeah. over there. Yeah, I'm gonna go and just bury them and just let them let them marinate for like the whole summer. I'll probably put a mineral lick out there. Pull that card right before season. It'll be like Christmas morning checking. Yeah. Oh, I did that this year. It's it's fun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I miss it. Every buck in the area is on that camera. I miss it, man. It's funny how like you know, you just get used to the cell yep. cam side of things. Like I pulled two cards a couple of weeks ago on that um, Ohio farm. Mm -hmm. There was one the far edge of that like the north. I guess it'd be like the northern corner there, and like all the bucks I thought were just like piling out of that. Mm. There was that big ravine in the back that yep. we didn't cut out mm -hmm. of. They're yep. just piling up out of that, mm. that ravine. And it was like, just going through and I'm like, there he is. There he is. That deer <laughs> live. There he is. I had a couple like decent bucks where I'm like, I don't know who that deer is. He mm. could be good next year. Heck cool. Yeah. Um, nice. Those minerals are, you know, deadly for inventory. We can't do that in Illinois. There's no, oh, yeah, yeah you can't even as brackets just wow. can't even spill your salt off your fries. Yeah. You know, in Illinois, Well, the guy but, who was hunting it before us did it. We found yeah, we found really. yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, but, uh, when we were walking at Dubai, we we're like, yeah, that's mineral lick. <laughs> yeah, we'll give a shout out to Trophy Rock sent us a pallet of stuff. We've they got did. some Isaac is our yeah. buddy out there. Sent us a pallet of Trophy Rocks. Dude, I mean, those are the staple. How many did you bring me? Uh, half of whatever's in there. Uh, I don't know. There's. Uh, you did bring me some? I didn't bring them, but they're in the box didn't for you. Is it? Well, dude, it was the day of the burn. <laughs> Believe me, I had every intention and I, I didn't forget. Yeah. It was like, it was 1030 and I was like, can I run over there and grab them real quick no, or just go fine. home and. That was the day we, we got burned. plenty of time. Yeah. Oh, dude, I got to show you the video of that burn. Yeah. I we did out that. there. It's not yep. to burn off like 10 acres, but dude, let's, let's talk about that just real yeah, quick. So and you were saying you don't have a lot of experience on the no, timber No, I, I haven't done any myself to be honest. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously here in Ohio, it's not super common. Yeah. Um, it's not. No, dude, people are terrified. Oh, yeah. yeah. There are, every neighbor will come up. It's like, we really, we call the neighbors uh, ahead of time if we can and the fire department and yep. But dude, it's so beneficial. Like it's, uh, especially on our stuff, so much of it is that old cattle pasture. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started with uh, just old pasture itself. Yeah, old fescue. Fescue, mm -hmm. yeah, just like fallow grass and stuff. And so we've gotten through most of that now. And so looking forward, you know, now I'm now I'm going to start moving into the timber, yep. you know, and we're dealing with the exact same stuff. Yeah. Your, your guy is that mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier, it's just predominantly multiflora when we mm -hmm. open it up, which yeah. I have hinge mm -hmm. or not just hinge cut, but uh, TSI, a whole bunch of it. And it's like they're, they bet in there. They, mm -hmm. they do. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what they have to work with, you know, but I just, th there is no early succession happening. Yeah. It's just basically open canopy and multiflora and mm -hmm. like, and you know, trails and stuff through it. And I've tried to manage it in the past, but, and so truthfully, I don't know, maybe somebody can get on and tell us what mm -hmm. will happen is I, I, I don't think that a burn is going to kill the multiflora. I think it's just going to restart it. Yeah. From the research I did, you'd have to do it year after year after year for a couple of years to make any dent. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think you're supposed to... That's not to, from first-hand experience. I mean, and it's not easy, yeah. but I think you're supposed to cut and chemical it. Like, that's how you kill it. And I gotcha. mean, good luck. <laughs> you like, cut and chemical? Or most, I hear yeah. guys spraying uh, glide just on the... Yeah, to start no, I think, I think because it's a heavy woody, wooded browse, you need like a, an amazapir. So I think you would need, you would want to like cut, cut it off and then paint the stump with like an amazapir to kill the root system. Okay. But I mean, that's... <laughs> Well, good luck. I mean, on a move. full multivore, no, I mean, you're going to look like you just went through a barbed wire <laughs> fence getting to that stump. You would need a machine. Is there yeah, a push it over, cut it, and, and well, paint a it. a mulch or head would be ideal, but a lot of, you know, for my property, for example, it's most areas are too steep or too wet to get to. You're yeah, not to cut that. it out. Yeah, most of mine are like, I mean, they're, you know, gradual hillsides or whatever, but. That's what that tornado area was mm -hmm. that you guys put that plot in is there was a ton of multiflora up there. There's also autumn olive and other stuff in there yeah. too. Yeah. Mixed I wonder bag. if you could do that though. I mean, I've only ever tackled it by myself. I went in with, like with a four wheeler and was was spraying with a wand and like So Mike with um drone deer, you know, he's got the spray side. Um and they did a project for the ODNR at some point this where is in timber though. Yeah, this is this was in timber too, but it was just like it was solid invasive. It's basically just nuked it. Um, and so any timber that was there, they just nuked everything. I think it's like tri triclop. 
Oh, they nuked over, over the top oh, of the yeah, timber? just everything, yeah. Which, in those areas, I think that was, I mean, way more overgrown than what we're, well, we're discussing you here. know, there may be a small time frame where that makes sense, like right now or a week mm -hmm. ago. If maybe it, right if now. If it's where foliar, the multiflora, yeah. Yeah, so you could just go over and dust it, like all the uh, multiflora is starting to green up right now, mm -hmm. but yeah. none of the leaves right. have sprouted. Right. Yeah, interesting. As long as so that's something I would Very interesting. Into. If you could, as long as it doesn't absorb through the bark of a tree. Yeah. I don't think it does, right? Depends on what you're spraying. I mean, some of that stuff is gly. like nuclear. I don't think gly will kill it. I don't think gly will kill. Yeah, I'm not sure what they were spraying. I think it does. I don't think gly will, will long-term kill a multiflora. I think you need some, you need a heavier hitter. Really? Yeah. 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 Cause it's, so, so gly, gly is primarily used on herbaceous plants. Like, kills herbaceous plants, mm. not woody mm -hmm. plants. So that's why, like... I'll tell you what, my multiflora is woody, too. <laughs> yeah, it's woody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She, yeah, exactly. It's solid root system. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. I think, like, if you look at... Um, so a lot of times, I, I forget which one it is. I think a mazapir is soil active. So, like, if you spray a mazapir um, on soil, like, it nukes everything. <laughs> like, uh, pretty much everything hardwood-wise is dead. Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple others that I think you could use as, like, a stump paint to be able to to kill that root system. But that's the key. Well, so in this case, there would be no stump painting. Like, if you're going to drone deer... <laughs> yeah, so maybe that's tri... I think it's tri... Triclop... Triglyceride? No. You can hear a damn dump truck driving to a new grassland plant. I think it's triclop. I, I know what it is. That's an interesting proposal, though, because I've got just way too... I mean, I'm toying with ideas of, like, do I bring out a crew of five, six guys and just mm -hmm. chainsaw and stump hit it? Stump hit it? Like, I'm sure we could make a dent, a dent with that, but it would yeah. suck. Yeah, it would suck really bad. Don't ask me. <laughs> okay, all right. And uh, you got to earn that Illinois tag, right? <laughs> but in the alternative would be, dude, yeah, if you could have... You know, th throw up a big ag yeah, drone and torch it. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, triclopier for herbicide, ideal for selective brush and small tree control needed, usually along fence lines. Um, alternatively, uh, you could cut the bush off and paint the stump. Now, can you Google um, does fire kill multiflora? Just see if you can find that. I out. think that that would be your your go to triclopier. Triclopier. Mm. Okay. Stuff. Interesting. Triclopier. Yeah, that's that I'd that never one. considered that before. Yep. Would that affect uh, like mature timber at all? Uh, I don't know. It says small trees and brush, so okay. maybe it's not powerful enough to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't test it on a forty-acre track. <laughs> sure, <laughs> so, let sure. it rip. Just uh, nukes it. It says in the early stages. Yeah, so when it gets gotcha. to that mature, yeah, fully mature. Yeah. yeah, this stuff is. Yeah, this might have harvestable value. <laughs> yeah, here, I've, got har I've got harvestable multiflora. <laughs> We've got some board feet there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, dude, that stuff is is nasty. Yeah. It is not easy. Same with like, uh, yeah, the autumn olives the same way. Like you start yeah. getting that stuff yeah. in there. The autumn olives almost worse at times because it, um, you know, can it, it seems to be more shade tolerant. Mm -hmm. So like on the multiflora rows, my stuff on on my particular property is you know, in year five now. So year, year one, two, three, you know, was pretty manageable to get through the property and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, last year and this year was real thick. But I've already noticed in some areas where it's beginning, you know, yeah. your, your canopies are starting to expand a little bit, starting to shade some stuff out, and it's getting better than it was. Of mm. the multiflora. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a, yeah, that's a big piece of it. I mean, that's one of the reasons from a hardwood fire, like, you know, next year, potentially, I could look at, a section on the cut that we did in Ohio mm -hmm. and burn that. So anything multiflora wise would start to be reduced there right. and anything like rubus and greenbrier mm -hmm. and is going to kind of take off and run. Dude, I like the fire. I think that's just a really good, it doesn't deal with the invasive. So, I mean, that's the problem mm -hmm. with it, but it, it definitely does. I mean, reset you. To well, a point. Think of the amount of leaf litter in some of these big hardwood areas. Yeah, and, and it's there for year. like, years. Like that stuff never goes away unless the, the burn it. It's yeah, the only it. way. I mean, I'll be marking a piece of timber. You can sit down. It's almost like a little bed. It's like springy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the hard part is, is like, so in Kentucky, I've thought about burning. I can't. Like I have to have a master burn license to mm -hmm. even run a fire down there legally, you know, and I don't want to. How is how is Ohio? Ohio? I think Ohio is wide open. Is it? I think you're supposed to like call some people. Well, there's a burn ban that goes into effect. I want to say it's March first. First, and yeah, so I heard that, that means well, that yeah. you can't burn between six a.m. and six p.m. Which okay. I don't necessarily understand. Yeah, that doesn't 
time frame, right? So we just started at 6 p.m. and <laughs> if, you got a, if, if you got a dry period, like we had a couple dry periods there in February and you burned on that farm, you would burn all that because it's going to be a slow roller anyway. Last year we burned in February. Well, I'll tell you what, dude. Yours is not a slow roller and the woods would be a slow roller. Timber is always slower burning. I think leaves are just not as flammable as grass. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. There's not as much fuel. Holds more moisture as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, our conditions this a couple days ago were just absolutely perfect. It had rained mm-hmm. a few days beforehand and uh, just really light wind uh, out of the east, actually. Mm. And um, so, I mean, the, the strategy there, there's all kind of stuff that guys can go look at online and stuff. But like breaks is the, the, the most important thing, you know, 80 to 90 percent of the success of a burn and having it not get away from you is the prep work. Prep work. Mm-hmm. So what we did, you know, because this was a uh, like basically a fallow field that we're trying mm-hmm. to manage for the grasses. And I wanted to come back with early successional Forbes and Woody Browse and stuff. Mm-hmm. We, per the recommendation of Craig Harper, sprayed it with glyphosate in mm-hmm. October once all the broadleafs had gone dormant. Yep, yep. So they were there in the summer. It looks great. looks thick. Mm-hmm. There's all kind of good stuff there. And then by October, it just looks like a grass field. Gotcha. So we sprayed it at that point, including you know, the, the break area around where, and dad made a mode that beforehand or something. So it was manageable. And then we disc that the crap, mm-hmm. the crap out of it. So it's just like a, t- we had a 10 foot something just, uh, just just dirt, mm-hmm. you know, all the way around the perimeter. And then once the conditions are right, so this is the other day. Now we went and light a backing fire on the, mm-hmm. the, so the backing fire. So that would have been on the West side with an East wind. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. yep. Yeah. Dude, lighting a fire, like lighting, lighting a back fire is all about you're fighting fire with fire basically and trying to just stay as completely on the downwind side as possible. So like if it's blowing at the corner, you know, I'm starting mm-hmm. like this, mm-hmm. I'm blowing gotcha. both out yep. and I want the wind blowing Yeah, or not at all. I, you want a little bit of wind. I mean, that's, it's, yeah, to feed otherwise it. you'd be surprised how slow a fire can move. Yeah. It's kind of, it can get kind of boring and tedious, but so once you do that, you start working the, uh, working the, working it out further and further. And eventually maybe the term's wrong, but those are going to be more like flanking fire. So now it's like they can burn sideways mm-hmm. with, with the wind. And yeah, those will move. It wants to go where the material is. Yep. Those will move a little bit faster. And then what we did just for the sake of time, frankly, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, cause we had a group of guys there that, yeah. you know, I didn't want to waste their whole nights. So it was a Sunday night. Once we got this whole flanking fire out, it's like, we're completely safe. I've got a big blackened area mm-hmm. on all of the downwind and, you know, uh, sides basically yep. of, of the deal and the biggest one that we did the other day was like six, six or eight acres or something mm-hmm. so not giant once that was done i walked and just ran and hit a head flame on the entire upwind yep. section mm-hmm. and it you know so if that entire backing and flanking flames took let's call it half hour to 45 minutes to work a third of the way mm-hmm. through that burn that head flame caught it in five <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> and I'll show you this video. So th- that's why people hate and get scared of fire. Oh, dude. And it's, I mean, when it met in the middle, so it's culminating, I think they call that like a circle of flame. It's not just a pure head flame. It's, mm. it's, mm. it's an entire ring of fire. Oh, Johnny, Johnny Cash. Cash style. Yeah. And <laughs> that's yeah, where it came from. He caught yeah. it in five minutes and it, it's like a tornado, a flamey tornado. Like part of me was Jeez. like, is this going to pick up and just like <laughs> go somewhere else? Like it was, but That'd be pretty wild, man. A yeah. freaking flaming tornado. Well, yeah, I'm like, Holy I'm like, shit. can that happen? Is that is that a real thing? So it didn't, fortunately. Should met, we Google this or no? <laughs> it, it met in the middle and died down, and uh, and it was um, that was it. Yeah, it was it was pretty nuts. Yeah, it was scor- scorched earth. You, you know, and try then I, to time but, it up with a rain potentially after the next day, or is that not really? A, a no, worry? because I knew it would be completely done. Uh, if you're doing a, a timber burn where you can have smoldering logs mm-hmm. and stuff, then yeah, maybe yeah, maybe you okay. want to have yeah. something. But if it's in the middle of a big blackened area, mm-hmm. there's just no fuel. Right. There's no fuel. Right. There's nothing left to burn. So it's no like, sheds in there, huh? No, hmm. not surprised. Which doesn't really, yeah. yeah. So then we went and burned off two smaller ones, and um, yeah, it was huge success and they look awesome cool. from last year well yeah and so right next to it we had stuff from last year that we burned mm-hmm. dude this summer and even right now granted it's not you know it's hard to describe kind of what it is it's like you have really low-lying uh uh what do they call it? legumes or whatever like yep. you're you know there's some clover and stuff coming in they're really low-lying green stuff mm-hmm. and then there's stuff that's six seven foot tall that was wow. like uh this big broad leaves goldenrod and <laughs> yeah stuff like it's that. maybe it's goldenrod there's some other stuff that just shot up Mm-hmm. And so it's not like, 
incredibly thick, but it is yep. tall and it is a visual barrier and they, mm -hmm. they will use it for sure. So I'm interested to see now in year two, what that, right. what that will produce. Should have more woody nice. stuff coming up in there. Yeah, I would think mm -hmm. so. It's, two and three. No matter what it is, it's a hundred times better than what it was, which right. was just nothing essentially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Open ground. Yeah. So that's, nice. that's exciting. So yeah. now, now we can move into the, the timber and we, we know what we're doing now. So it's, I mean, that's the strategy. Always start with a backing flame, always have people there the tools to use are drip torches yep. you want to have you want to have two guys you yep. want to have two guys with drip torches that are communicating and you're working both sides mm -hmm. to get ahead of it and if you do that and you have the brakes in like you really don't need anybody else but it's good to have sure. them there uh with backpack blowers leaf or yeah. leaf blowers that's you know to mm -hmm. to either fuel or put out the flame and big rakes that's mm -hmm. the other one mm -hmm. like shovels are not great they don't really do anything They're just raking you know, start with the backing flame, and once well, once, once you remove fuel, there's nowhere for it to go. Like you said, so it's that prep work. I mean, those breaks and things like that. I mean, you you do that right, and the job goes fairly easy. Yeah, that's why I was kind of surprised with Winky just diving into it. <laughs> oh my goodness! If anybody saw on YouTube, and Winky's obviously a good friend. We're not judging him. Or whatever, I'm sure it's going to be awesome. He did a freaking he did a solo solo burn. It was like twenty some acres of a timber burn. Big chunk. I can't think of a dumber thing to do, frankly. <laughs> I would never do that and it's by dry. myself. It's dry out there, dude. We yeah. know it. We we oh. we were just out there and we talked to people. It is in a massive drought out well, there. Well, and you know what? I he was getting snow and rain that night. Yeah. So per the like, you know, logs and stuff going. But fortunately, unfortunately, I've had some small fires get away from me before, and I know how terrible that'll give you a heart attack in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, from a timber side, you don't really have it get away with you get away from you too much there but i mean you hear more and more people getting you know fl fires getting away from them and that's how these you know brush wow. fire out fires and stuff start and the stakes are higher just i'll say generally in the northeast like we have more structures like there's houses right, by the right. roads and stuff yeah. like if you're in kansas and iowa it's like you know guys will say yo we've had fires get away we call the fire department they're like any structures in a way and you're like no we saw like, all right we'll just <laughs> it'll be that, fine i guess that was that was in no that was in kansas iowa. no iowa was it iowa we, we walked the whole piece that we're going to be hunting this year yeah. and then the guy two days later was like hey the neighbor lit a fire it scorched 600 acres burnt right up to the Holy road cow. next to the farm yeah that's right jeez <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's nuts to see but it is a tool i mean it used to happen a lot you know now because of the so you know social uh, aspect of it like fire is not used nearly as much as it used to be used yeah and that does affect a lot of the habitat you know that we're mm -hmm. that we're talking about especially to set it back you know into what's more favorable for grouse and nesting birds and and deer especially topography um, is something is a deterrent as well i think it's, sure it's when you have like sections in mm -hmm. the midwest where it's like just a yeah, there's just, nowhere for it to go it's gonna run a section point. it's it's manageable where you're out where we're at where it's like the property lines are not straight. It's not mm -hmm. like on a section. There's hills and topography. Yep. It's it takes more mm -hmm. prep. Yeah, I was trying to think how I'd break mine up, and it would be there's some ravines and ditches and creeks mm -hmm. and stuff you could use. But okay, so I here, think we could do it in on that southern Ohio piece now with all those roads in there. <laughs> here, here was you know something that comes to mind when you consider something like this. So what if you what if you burn across a gas line and there's a leak in the oh. gas pipe? That's not gonna go there's over a, well. There's a lot of those down in this area. Yeah. Yeah. A lot and a lot of leaks. A lot of those have leaks. Yeah. yeah, I don't think that goes well. That's why these houses keep exploding. So I think you use the gas line as a break, and you know, assuming there's I would make sure it doesn't get anywhere close. I was gonna to the say gas I would line. want to have a pretty good buffer there. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think you burn up to the to the edge there. <laughs> <laughs> Two yeah. foot. That should be good. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean that. Uh, you have a lot. I mean. Really, some of those houses are exploding because of uh, unta like uncapped wells and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, Dude, the Dairy Mart exploded in 1958 because there was uh, oh, those fuel tanks. Yeah, no, it blew up. There was no, no, it was uh, whatever su sewage gas or something coming back up. Hmm. There was mm -hmm. no gas supplying the property. It was an electric, electric everything. Like a National Lampoon's Christmas thing. Yeah, and there was a Duquesne Light employee. Lit a cigarette in the building and threw it in the. No, it just was standing there. Holy, Holy cow! cow. There's cow. enough of it coming up, and the whole thing blew up. Jeez. There's so pictures of it in my back. Damn sewage gas, Nick. You gotta watch that shit. Yeah. It'll get you. No, I'm back up fast. <laughs> Damn. Uh, um, That's why they're funneling it all into the Mon River now. 
<laughs> yeah, I guess. I guess so. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Muddy. Man, Jared, we probably have been using Muddy products for at least 10 years now. It's a long time, dude. It's been a long time. And I can remember when it was simply just safety harnesses and camera arms of all things. And, you know, that's evolved to where you and I both have a bunch of Muddy box blinds as well. I would say a bunch. But yeah, they, they've come a long way. And certainly the box blinds are, are huge. Shot that buck over your shoulder out of a Muddy box blind a couple of years ago. The harness and, and all of the other safety accessories really are, are a major component of of what Muddy offers for me. Um, you know, we've had some injuries in the past, you know, I've had some, some tree stand accidents. This, this is all back before we were using, uh, you know, frankly, harnesses, mm-hmm. uh, the lineman's belt while we're hanging stuff, and the safe lines. I have those in every single one of, uh, you know, our fixed tree stands now. And uh, so we really have made safety a priority. Uh, that, that's a big deal for us. And, uh, you know, Muddy has everything we need for that. Yeah, and I think uh, the cool thing about Muddy is anyone listening to the Hunter podcast can save 20% using the code HUNTER20, that's H-U-N-T-R-2-0. Uh, anything that you can see on the Muddy Outdoors store online, use that code, save yourself 20% for this hunting season. Go Muddy. So did you hunt Illinois last year, or you just went out purely for the uh, timber? Just for the to, timber, yeah, I didn't hunt it at just all. Just to look at our farm or yep. to look at some other places? There was, I had like three or four of them I was looking at. Yep. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Are you looking at hunting or... I would, someday I'm going to own a farm out there, but yeah, I definitely either need to find a lease or some permission or something out there because i got plans to kill a buck early this well, year. Well, dude, so. between us and, and Ben, right? Is there yeah, some- he said there was potentially a property I could lease off of him, so. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Yep, we'll see. Try and get something figured out, but. Dude, it's, uh, I mean, it's the Midwest. That's, that's. Yeah, it's yeah. That's the real deal out there. And I like, you know, you drive out there, it's like, oh my goodness, just everything just mm-hmm. looks awesome. Dude, we went out, uh, well, the first time was in the summer. Yep. Yeah, it was summer by the time we went there. And we just did a lot of driving around. Mm-hmm. And was that when we put an offer in? Yeah, we put our so offer in, in like July. July, something like that. Right before okay. 4th of July, yeah. Close in September. So in July, we're just driving around. And it's just, dude, it's just beautiful mm-hmm. country. Like, it's just clear skies, sunny, like just ag as far as you can see. Yep. Not a lot of like riffraff, which mm-hmm. is cool. You know, it's like we, in Ohio, we, we Reminds have, me of like Western Ohio, like Dayton up to mm-hmm. Lima and that area there. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, we just fell in love with it and. Yeah, we're not we're not we're not freaking selling. <laughs> yeah, it'll be cool this year to, because a lot of that's going to be beans around us. Where last year it was corn, so like we couldn't see shit. I'm so excited, dude. This year I've I've just there's a lot of things falling in place, like in mm-hmm. multiple states. You know, l- let alone Iowa, which who knows what we're going to get into there. That that may be the best of all three, but that two plus I'm acre uh, alfalfa and rye field is like bumping every night mm-hmm. on that Illinois place mm-hmm. at the pinch pinch. Mm-hmm. Like it, it's it's loaded with deer. We need to, you and I need to put, put pen to paper here and like make sure we have a good strategy here mm-hmm. for like if it's, we need to get out and spray that rye at some point, mm-hmm. right? And then, uh, and I think we need to time that, uh, that uh, mobile hunter show. Mm-hmm. Th- that's probably the time to plant our brassicas. Although, no, 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 no. That's too late, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Okay, that's too late. I that's mean, a, if, we want, if we want bulbs, it's too late. I want, <laughs> yeah, I want them bulbs. I want to be there. Do the deer hit them pretty good out there? We didn't have any this year. Okay. Not very well, not not, many. Not they an, did, not I mean, enough. but there weren't enough. They were in the plots because there was rye in there. I'm just, I'm more and more switching over to clover. I've just, yeah. just had pretty yeah. poor success with here's, brassicas in here's general. Here's my strategy. I think you'll like this. Anything less than an acre. An acre. It's, okay. it's clover yeah. or alfalfa yeah. or uh, some sort of cereal mm-hmm. grain. Yep. Uh, anything bigger, bigger than an acre, but less than something that would sustain standing mm-hmm. grain, which I would call like four to five acres, mm-hmm. is brassicas. Gotcha. So most of my brassica yeah. fields are like two, two and a half mm-hmm. acres. Yep. And then we've got the big, dude, that, that big 10 acre bean field that we planted this year mm-hmm. was, in my opinion, the thing that made our farm so much better. This I was year. debating. So I got like five, eight, uh, four or five acres um, that I did in corn this year. And I was, I don't, I don't know. I like the, the cover aspect of corn, like you talked about, mm-hmm. but I um, was trying to decide if I want to sculpting help. factor. You can have edges right. and stuff. Yeah. Right. I was trying to decide if I wanted to do beans or not. I got the neighbors got 15 acres of beans right beside me. That'll be mm-hmm. in the rotation this year. So I think it could, you know, handle the browse pressure. Mm hmm. Just didn't know, you know, was there a pretty significant draw then, you know, in like November? Huge. It really is. Yeah, I mean, beans, my corn, yeah. they really didn't hit that until December. It wasn't yeah, cold enough. Yeah. Too. yeah. They, I mean, they, they're eating the corn to build carbs, mm. up, you know, and it, I don't think it was cold enough. Plus, yep. corn and acorns are basically in the same food group for them. 
So when you have all those acorns, like they they don't need the corn, right? Mm -hmm. They're building fat. They're building carbs through that. When it comes to protein, beans are kind of in their own group with Mm -hmm. clover and and brassica and stuff like that. So, you know, if you look at kind of a selection standpoint, like in years of high acorns, they're not going to hit the corn hard. In fact, like I still have plenty of standing corn in in Kentucky. Like it's it's yep. crazy. Yep. Um, that's where I found that shed the other day. I did look the other day. Whether they finally fell off or just finally got eaten by everything, my I am just now finally picked completely clean on, on the beans. Mm. On the beans. But yep. they were there, you know, there were stuff on... Uh, Sounds on, right. March would be the last part the of them. On stock all the way through end of February, you know, until stuff... Huge, man. Such an amazing source of protein throughout the toughest time that those deer are facing. It was perfect. And I've got a lot of green... Th- yeah. I, we do a lot of clover, too. In fact, yep. just the other day, I went and checked... You know, I've got seven or eight, you know, small uh, quarter to half yep. acre food plots that I, pl- uh, clover plots that I planted mm-hmm. last year from scratch. Mm-hmm. That was the first mm-hmm. year. And they look, they look yeah. great. Yeah, I got one too that was from last year. Look awesome. I got getting those established. And that's in the spring, so satisfying yeah, to go and be like, look is. at this clover, but yeah. it's just like a carpet of yeah, green. Mm-hmm. Solid. Yeah, it's beautiful. Mm. I, I want your opinion on this. I broadcasted uh, clover into that uh, tin shed guys line. Yep. And it's rye. It's, it's rye is what I planted in last year. I put clover in there. I don't know whether to leave it as clover. Like, I think it'll do well because it's... Uh, You're going to have to nuke that rye out of yeah, there yeah, with a clef it in. It. Yep. That's why I bought that clef in mm-hmm. the other day. But I have other surrounding clover plots. So I'm mm-hmm. like, do I just like redo the cycle, you think? Just broadcast rye right into the... I would either broadcast cereal grain or brassica into it this fall. And just I don't think I could do clover. brassica. I don't think there's enough sunlight. Okay. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I would just do a cereal and grain it's too into small. it. Just bro- broadcast cereal grain into the clover. You nuke the clover when we do that? Mm-mm. I just broadcast straight into it. That's what I did this past fall. Just any, mm-hmm. I had a few bears patches and just took some rye over top of everything. Okay. Because yeah. I have that West Twin in clover. And I'm mm-hmm. like, it's right there. Do I, is it, you know. I mean, I think it is a good, um, you know, it's a good balance to have those. I mean, if you've got one plot that's highly attractive, it's going to get mowed heavy. You know, so to have some offset of balance yeah, there. But is both the clover help. and rye is so tolerant. To br- it did mm-hmm. get hammered, but till it's- November, then it really gets pounded. You know, because you're not yeah. getting the growth out of it. The beans are the toughest part because I mean, if you plant beans, you're also asking to increase deer populations. I mean, that's the whole point of beans. That's what mm-hmm. I'm gonna do in Kentucky this year. I'm gonna just plant a shitload of beans. Yeah. In fact, I'm picking mine up. Uh, you know who sells uh, the beans is uh, Trey Carnes from Whitetail. Remember Trey from West Virginia? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's a dealer. Okay. I didn't even know it. I ordered him, and oh, I didn't realize it was him. He called me. He's like, hey, uh, I thought this was you. And I was like, yeah. So I'm going to pick him <laughs> nice. up on I, Monday. I called that place in New Philadelphia, and they just didn't. They don't have it yet. They're going to call me back and see if they're going to get I'm going to pick up 13 bags on Monday. Yeah, nice. Do you plant uh, just standard rate? No, I got a little heavier on it. Yeah, I'm doing 50 pounds per acre on mine. Um, if you got enough acreage, you're probably all right. Yeah, and so I, I'll probably go a little heavier in that bottom in Ohio because mm-hmm. I'm going to put beans yep. in there. But in Kentucky, I'll go 50 pounds an acre straight gotcha. through. But I've got three, four, six. I've got probably 10 acres going in there. Okay. Nine nice. acres, yeah. something like that. Yeah. I, um, I don't go too crazy with it. I did. I, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot for like 12 acres. <laughs> Of beans on ten acres is what okay. I'm gonna do. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. What uh, what brand are you planting? Mind me asking. The uh, real world. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The real Gen world twos. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah they gotcha. they've done really well for me. They they don't shatter or anything. It's just they they're great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's they're what great. I was gonna put in this year's. So. Yeah. And I drilled them, which was I okay. mean, amazing. So I mm-hmm. rented. Uh, which I still don't think they've, pe- you can send me an invoice from the township that uh, sent me, or from the county. <laughs> they've got like a thirty thousand dollar land pride drill. Okay. Nice. So and they just you know. They just drop it off. One farmer mm-hmm. drops it off at the local church or whatever, and then you pick it up from the wow. parking lot. You just tow it to your house and then set the settings, and mm-hmm. it's amazing. Yeah, yeah that's cool. awesome to have. It's awesome. So I just nuke everything, you know, whatever, a week before. I want to have it, like, fairly cleared mm-hmm. and stuff. Yeah, trail it in and do your broad. Yeah. I'm going to turn everything. Well, obviously, oh, yeah. where they came through yeah. with the machines is mm-hmm. going to be compacted. Yep. But I'm also going to turn all those old pastures where I planted corn last year in Kentucky because I just drilled it. I didn't turn it. And mm-hmm. it was that drill's not heavy enough. Yeah. So I'm going to turn everything, spray it. And then I'll, uh, you know, once it starts growing up, spray it. And then that'll give me a much better bed to use that drill. And it'll work mm-hmm. fine at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, Josiah is going to do mine mm-hmm. uh, game plan. So, yep. 
Yep. Yeah, he did an awesome job with those plots. Yeah, look killer. So, what's Josiah's business? Game plan, uh, game plan, land management. Yeah, yep. And he's out, out of Ohio. Of Ohio. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they they travel a little ways, but um, probably two and a half hours or so one way from Holmes County area. Holmes County, Kershawton. Yeah, Kershawton. Yeah. So he did two six tenths of an acre plots for me, one a little over an acre and one about two acres mm-hmm. on in Ohio and ground out all the stumps on them. And it's like, like he said close to a hundred stumps or something. <laughs> it's insane. It looks baller, <laughs> like wild. And the reason they ground them out from what he was telling me is they want to retain as much of that topsoil as possible. Yep. So when you're digging them out, you're getting rid of way too much topsoil. Yeah. So yeah, they look awesome. And then Madison went down and frost seeded some of them because Mm-hmm. I've, I didn't get to him. And there's nothing better than just like a good looking food plot hunting. Over. It's just fun. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Dude, it's, I, this year, I, uh, there's the buck. Remember that I passed on later in the season? He's got that mm-hmm. kind of webbed out fork or whatever. I think he's, I think he was maybe three, more likely four, I mm-hmm. think. And I just, uh, you know, I just, you had stacked a few bucks by Well, then. frankly, he was in around <laughs> a, a corn pile and I was, I was hunting for does. I shot two does out from under mm-hmm. him and I just, you know, I just didn't want to shoot him, but. Um, he's coming, he's staying further, uh, like on the Beedles, I believe. I yeah. was talking to John about that the other night. He's, he was stoked to see that we passed him. He's like, we saw that deer and he's like, we were going to pass him if we saw him. And I was like, this one here. And he's like, yeah. Yeah. So that was cool. You know, we're always trying to How's work Josh doing? together on that. Eh, not great. Hit or miss. Yeah. I think it's just balance is not great and stuff is he's tired, tired all the time from his treatment. But anyways, that deer's living down there. First time I saw him was running up out of that bottom. And you remember, mm-hmm. remember that day? I was like, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this. So what I did this year preemptively as like a potential strategy, because I where he's coming at, it, just there's nothing huntable on our mm-hmm. on our property there. It's like there's an old farmstead yep. and nothing else further than that. So what I did was I put some of those trophy rocks and stuff right mm-hmm. outside of the window of the house there. It's like there's a nice little stump there. <laughs> Listen, if he, and it's going to be beans this year. Yeah. Is it? I don't know. I don't know what it's going to be. Regardless, it's it's going to be that little knob that the mm-hmm. homestead is on. It's like there's nothing around it, so it's like it's going to be interesting how this sets up. But if that deer starts hitting that in the summer, I'm going to make the call to wrap the entire homestead in a screen. Yep. And and plant that. Plant it. And mm-hmm. and hunt it out of the house window. <laughs> <laughs> I've hunted out of barns before, but never a house. It's old, an old, it's old homestead. No, it's, nice. an, it's an ancient house. Yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, it's I, like I, it, I know what you mean. it needs a torch, but it's like it sets up perfectly. Nice. Is that where that big buck ran up? That one day you're in the rut. He was tending that doe in the middle of the field. It's like a big nine point or something. Yeah, that was him. That was him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Came right up out of there. Yeah, and it, that's how they come. You know, it's one of those main drainages. It's it comes up through there, and it's just weird. It's like there's no way to hunt it. It's mm-hmm. just like an old farmstead in the middle of this like little drainage or mm-hmm. walnuts and stuff yep. kind of around there. So, mm-hmm. but if he mm-hmm. if I get some kind of a pattern of use there on that mineral site, I will clear that out, screen around it, and put a food plot right in there. There you go. <laughs> that's crazy, man. Yeah, strategy. It's gonna come up fast, man. I mean, we're April. Yeah. We're. I mean, this is dropping in April. You know, any new clover plots you frost seed or stuff are gonna start popping pretty heavy. And Dude, n- right now is when you really benefit from those clover. I mean, from a planting mm-hmm. work perspective, it's yeah. like how nice yeah. is it to not? Ha- Last year I put a ton of work in yeah. to get those things established, yep. and now I'm like walked out. You know, th- threw mm-hmm. some extra little extra frost seed over them. I'll, I'll hit them with deer grow a little later on. We'll mow yep. them and stuff. But otherwise, we're pretty good to yeah, go. I don't have to plant anything till all the- of my properties are an hour plus away for me and it's like yeah it's just so nice when you don't have to deal with putting plots in every fall that's and stuff. a two acre alfalfa oh, yeah. field in kentucky right oh, now nice. oh. yeah that's killer that thing's gonna look good with velvet coming through it in september uh yeah that's <laughs> when so i planted beans and it failed and so it was like july and i was like oh i'm gonna put alfalfa i didn't mm. know put alfalfa in Did and even broadcast that yeah just broadcast right really? into it and uh this fall, it looked, I mean, for Alfalfa's nice for yeah. like six months. I mean, it looked pretty freaking good. I think that uh, people historically, ha- I I have been like afraid to do it. it just well, it's just, a finicky plant. Everybody mm-hmm. says it's a go. Oh, it's so hard to get to grow and stuff, but it's like it. I, it Mine worked great. Yeah. I mean, I, I frost seeded this weekend. I went through and frost seeded some more clover and alfalfa into it. Um, but like I said, last year, just like failed bean plots seeding over it with that like i had substantial alfalfa in it i think you love it i think it's yeah. a, a really nice compliment to clover because clover yep. struggles in drought so like mm-hmm. in a in a droughty year that you know it'll work well together mm-hmm. 
you know, you well, can, that's it. I mean, at mine, I'm not trying to like harvest alfalfa to like yeah. right. feed. So like my plots are all clovers and alfalfa. Like it's probably heavy handed oh, alfalfa, gotcha. but I'm mixing clovers okay. in it. Like whether it's arrow leaf or crimson mm -hmm. or whatever, maybe some white clover in there, but it's like, I just want a lush early season through the summer type yeah. food source. And that's what it is. Yeah. And if any of it like is lacking or failing or, or whatever, you can go in in September and hit yeah, it with a cereal it. grain. Dude, that is the strategy. I feel like we're finally kind of getting a handle on these it spray was, food plots. I kind it. of messed up last year. I did basically brassicas and corn. And like you said, you know, the, the brassicas didn't really have any draw until yeah. late. And to be honest, they didn't even hit them much at all. And then it's they just didn't hit the corn corns, until man. December. Huh. And, you know, I do have some other properties then that were in clover and just getting hammered. hammered. I mean, hammered. Interesting. Yeah. Our brassica plots were getting hammered in September because okay. we had such Mine a dry, dry August and September. And they have so much uh, moisture content. And that was on your Ohio farm? Uh, yeah. So that, uh, where that big blind is, that hawk mm -hmm. blind is mm -hmm. that my alpha or my brassica got mowed. In fact, I went back in and, and did winter weed over top because they were gone. I don't gone. understand what, cause I mean, my neighbor planted some brassicas and did, I mean, the deer hit them pretty good. So mm -hmm. I don't, I, I plant a little bit early July, like very end of July. Um, they, didn't, I plant. they didn't crush the bulbs this year, at least on those plot. Yeah. Nor in, I mean, in they, they would hit either. the tops that I got bulbs in there this yeah. big. I mean, just ridiculous. They wiped out even here. Like I have a, you know, just under an acre plot here and I did brassicas and then in September it was like, just like it did last year, it's starting to look super thick, looks awesome. And then we hit that drought and they mm. just, yeah, I mm. mean, gone. Like there was nothing. I went back in with annual clover and winter wheat to just have gotcha. a food plot. That's cereal grain, man. That's, yeah. that, that's the deer hunters like savior rye right there. Is, yeah. Just put it in. Yeah. Stuff. Rye is money. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I agree. Yep. 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 For sure. Rye or winter wheat. I mean, oats are good early. Like I, if I have a decent clover plot, I will potentially seed in oats knowing that it plays to like the prior to November time frame. But then after November, those oats aren't real cool tolerant. They, they go down pretty, pretty quick. Triticale does well but not why do you say that i mean you, are you implying that like they don't they won't hit the rye early on uh i i think that the oats hold more sugar content in the early season mm. from a palatability standpoint i'm not saying that they won't eat the rye or they won't eat winter wheat early it's just oh if you have the choice oats are more highly preferred at that time interesting but then they're not as cold tolerant so what you won't right. have is like no, but that's like minnesota type stuff yeah, to right? a point. I mean, if if we start getting it heavy get cold heavy cold in like end of November, <laughs> early December, like it's not, it won't. You know, it's just gonna lay down. Which I think is fine. I mean, where where mine's at, it's uh, well, frankly, I'm only gonna have. Well, I don't know, last year, anyways, I only had one real one. It was up that tinch of gas, yep. line and I did it because. Uh, it's there's a lot of shade mm -hmm. up there and it's just uh, and it's not very big mm -hmm. so and i just wanted an attractiveness up there so but i don't i don't know i'd consider doing oats there this year i guess i mean the nice thing about oats or triticale or, or winter wheat is like you know you don't have to terminate it like you do a, a sure. rye um so you know from a time stand but like right now the the winter wheat behind my house and that plot is like i mean it's it's doing what rye's doing right and mm -hmm. like I don't have to terminate that until I plan again for the fall. I can kill that with clathodim, right? The rye? Right. Yeah. Okay. Yep. It's grass. Yep. That's what I'm going to have to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You want to kill it in the- How early do you spray that stuff? Uh, I was going to say, you want to you want to kill it in a grass stage. So, I mean, you don't want to let that go until like July or August. Like you want to kill it here in April or May. Month. Okay. I was going to say, but you probably wouldn't want to spray quite yet with the clover being so young. Yeah. The, clethi the clethanum is fine with the clover. Okay. So you don't have to worry. That's, that's one of the nice parts about it. I mean, if it's in clover or alfalfa or even chicory, like you don't have to worry about it, gotcha. but it's, you want, you want to where it's actively- growing and pulling nutrients in. Mm -hmm. So it's going to suck that in as well. So yeah, I think most people are terminating in like end of April, early May. Okay. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Muddy and Stealth Cam Trail Cameras. Cell cams, cell cams, cell cams. What an evolution the industry has seen. And we've experienced personally over the past five, 10, you know, whenever cameras were invented, right? It's like, man, it's totally changed the way that we inventory deer, pattern deer, and ultimately the decisions that we make when we're going out to hunt. They're a serious piece of the puzzle. And, and uh, you know, that information is invaluable for us. We trust the Muddy and Stealth Cams, you know, together to be able to, to collect any of that information. Yeah, I mean, as an admitted trail cam addict, you know, I've definitely been guilty of, of under hunting places or relying too heavily on that information that's come in. That said, it's an invaluable tool to the overall management plan and strategy that I have for my own properties or even hunting public land. It doesn't matter. We have a finite amount of time 
in going out and hunting. So when you and I are after a particular class or quality of deer, usually a mature buck, we can't waste time hunting an area where that deer doesn't exist. And those cell cams provide that information that allow us to spend the time in the area with the highest chance to accomplish our goals. I say it all the time, man. You can't kill them if they're not there. That's it. So right now, any of our listeners can use uh, code HUNTER20 to get 20% off either Muddy or Stealth cameras. Uh, we're certainly going to be taking advantage of that, and we hope you guys do too. Yep, check out Stealth Cam and Muddy. Let me pose this to you. Mm-hmm. Do you think we should go out to Illinois in the next month or so? And terminate our rye in the with the top we, plot. We them to in the all of them. I mean, we put it in all of the plots. Yeah, terminate in all of them. And I, the later you get, the you know, I'd say I'd say if we go out in April mm-hmm. and you could nuke or we could uh, you could hit, frost seed into all it. of our rye and continue to uh, yeah, maybe we're slightly past it's the not frosting frost. point. I mean, it doesn't matter. Like you, I mean, that's all I did in July with you know alfalfa what I'm saying, for our perennial plots, and mm-hmm. then. The next trip would not have to be until like end of July mm-hmm. for our brassicas and stuff. Yeah, we could pull everything else is pretty much handled. We'll pull a side by side and sprayer to do it. You up for that? Mm hmm. All right. Yep. Yep. I think so. All right. Necessary. Find some sheds. See if Carl's still alive. Go kill turkey. <laughs> there you go. It's an interesting proposal. When's that coming season? Find some mushrooms, pull some sheds, kill turkey. Bet you find some mushrooms on that property. When's that coming season? April? Why'd you run into some? Some mushroom yeah, heads. Just a lot of, lot of. Uh, it's got. It's got, got the habitat uh, for it. <laughs> <laughs> it's got the habitat for it. Yep. Um, I bet that's mid-April. Let's see, Illinois. It wouldn't surprise me if we get guys walking it. Oh, I, uh, I guarantee. Yeah, we do. I bet you too. You do. Uh, let's see here. I'd be into that. Spring turkey lottery. What? That mean? Maybe that's because the density is so low. County specific permits remaining after will be over the counter now. Click here to see. I'm getting old, Nick. I can't see. <laughs> there we go. Just booked a trip. Uh, it says there's 53 tags left in the first season, 78 tags left in the second, 128 in the third. Wow. Boy, that's where nine hours is so much more manageable than like 16 to Kansas. Even nine that's that's a strong hole out there, man. See, that don't scare me at all. Not so, let's see. What was I saying? First season is April 8th to the 12th. It's perfect. Fourth is the 25th oh, to the 1st. Nice. And fifth is the 2nd to the 9th. Let's get it up, dude. Let's get out there in the next couple of weeks. Be fun. Nice. Yeah, so we got some time. I think that's a good strategy. Okay. If we can do that, we can knock out all of our perennial plots this year, kill all the rye, mm-hmm. and then go back in... Where do we want annual plots? Uh... Well, definitely the cove mm-hmm. is going to be Braska's. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think you want to plant a screen at, I think, roughly the same time that we plant the Braska's, like July. Yeah. Okay. And then the only other one that's in question would be what we talked about earlier is the pinch versus up by the road. I think you keep the pinch and you make it a perennial just with alfalfa and clover in it. We could we would kill out the rye and we'd oversee another alfalfa clover mix right now. Or this spring? I I think it's big enough to sustain an annual down there, Nebraska. Sure. I think uh, maybe we do that in the short term, mm-hmm. but go back in August and uh, July, rather, and uh, put, put some Nebraska's in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we could put them and even that, up and at that the that front. that would do it. The only real like heavy lifting that needs done is if we want to clear out a little bit bigger section on the... Uh, the uh, honey hole, the honey hole, yeah. I think you just put clover in there and just well, you know where I'm clover. talking, yeah, just a chainsaw, sure, clear so out some of that. that brush there. Carl's yeah. got four of them. But honestly, the main thing I want to do there is solidify a scrape tree, yeah, like have that really, yeah, dude. That'd be a I think we're giving are we giving up the river plot? We we folding on that one? If so, we could just bring some switch and seed it into there. That's a good point. I think it's a good one to keep. That's that's let's look at that one. Okay, let's think about. It's that tough one. to hunt. That's why I say that. It's not that it's not a good plot. It's just tough to get in there and hunt. You were yeah. like waving to me in the tree. I could see in the camera. Well, so so well, okay. Well, so here would be. <laughs> <laughs> there's like deer right underneath them. I see Jerry. Well, like, okay. <laughs> so he, here would be maybe there's our compromise. Maybe instead of doing that big plot with the box plant like we're talking about, uh-huh. maybe that is your east wind. Setup. Yeah, yeah, probably. I like that because I do. That's a. That's a money spot it's right there. It's a great there. spot. If we can they screen, come right down over that. If yeah. we can screen that in, 
Mm-hmm. Let, okay, I'll take a. I'll take another. All we'll, right. we'll put a little right. brain power on that one. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay, yeah. okay. There yeah. we go. We got it figured out. I like that. Yeah, just like that. You don't got a plan, just like that. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, I. Want to think... come shoot an old piece of shit? Sure. <laughs> yeah, we got plenty of them. <laughs> I think uh, they're fun to shoot. Uh, I think the clover aspect of things will be, we'll all see that benefit here. You know. Uh, early to late summer like you just consistently see these deer starting to hit these clover plots you know as we transition into that september time period <sighs> man i'm sorry to cut you off dear me. i yeah. do wish we could put mineral on that farm like that's mm. sure is why why do they have that is that's just cwd from, mm. i don't think that's why they have it i think it's a justification now well i mean i think it's been for a while disease mm. yeah mm. Yeah, because from a hunting standpoint, like guys aren't killing deer over mineral. I do think that we will, um, if we position that right, especially over perennials, we will see a lot of velvet bucks because they're going to be bedding in there with beans all around. Yeah. It's the only major bedding there. I think so too. You know, we probably want to bury a camera up on that point in that woods where Mm -hmm. we saw that big bedding area and stuff. Yeah. Fine. So, but yeah. I mean, maybe walk that property line and see see what we think on that. Mm hmm. (laughs) <laughs> yeah i mean i yeah it's uh well i mean right now is really kind of weird because yeah you still got deer holding and then like i'm already waiting to see like you know big i haven't seen coming any holding. Up. i mean as of i think most of them are off now yeah i think the last year that i had maybe i might have a spike yet but the last year i've that got I dropped i've yeah. got an eight a small eight you know one or two year old on ohio that's still holding and i've got a small eight on that kentucky place holding hmm. but other than that yeah, I haven't seen anything like here recently. Any day, any day now. Yeah, well, that one I found, I was seeding switch right on an edge for a screen, and I like was walking and looked, and there it was, just sitting there in the cornfield. Did I tell you I found the right side off that broken brow eight this year that Dale was hunting initially? Yeah, I. Well, you didn't tell me. I saw it in a story. Mm. I had to follow our stories to see that. <laughs> That's how I see all your stuff, dude. <laughs> We, Jeremy I was like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> so we have like dueling stories sometimes. Jeremy's out doing his thing, and then I get a post. I'm like, oh, here's what I'm doing. <laughs> I, yeah, I saw a story. I was like, I was like, is this Jared? And I, I see I, like Missy. I was like, it is him. I tripped on it, literally. You did? Yeah. And it, uh, I went in and hung a camera on that mox. Because uh, he's got all those, like, what, he's got like three brows or something on that side? No, that's that triple brow oh. eight. That's a three year old yeah. from last year. I'm talking about the one that Dale was hunting early on. Oh, on the hall. oh, oh, oh. And then he moved over about. on the beans and stuff. Yep. And nice looking deer. Yeah. Not real heavy. It's the one I saw crossing the mm-hmm. driveway early on with Corey. And uh, yeah, found one of his sheds right in front of a camera that had died. I went, I was running, oh. I was literally jogging in to pull the camera. I was kind of in a rush. And I tripped over it. Son <laughs> of a bitch. <laughs> I didn't fall, but I. Nice. I yeah. found. I mean, nothing great. I found seven sheds on that new Kentucky farm this Whoa, year. That's like wow. the most I've ever found I thought anywhere. you said food nice. didn't do anything for you. Right? No, they kept them after the season, apparently. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's like the most I've ever found on any property. That's pretty cool. Before. I found a surprisingly yeah. few number of sheds around that bean field. Just, I think, because the, the weather conditions didn't have them tight on it. Yeah, they, I agree. They were hitting it, but they just, a yeah. lot of guys, I think, had a, probably not a great shed year. I experienced yeah. a lot of deer bedding a little bit further than they typically would this time of year. I bet it's tough to find a, a little shed bit on of your that, place, though. It, I mean, it is. Thick. Yeah, a little bit of it, too, is, you know, I was doing work projects in there pretty mm. early. I was, whatever, wasn't yeah. too concerned. I still found one side of the deer I'm chasing next year, so. Yeah, the Amish found, what, like three on my place down there yep. in Ohio? Mm-hmm. Nice. So, nice. Yeah, it's pretty impressive for like cutting timber and being in woods. <laughs> he said one. I I talked to him the last like ri- they literally cut the last tree and they were like celebrating basically. And, <laughs> and they were uh, ready to get out of there. Yeah, they were ready to get the hell out of there. <laughs> and so I I was I was seeding. I walked up and we were just shooting the shit. And he's like, yeah. He's like that one said. He's like, there's this uh, tension fence that they had between the fifty and the sixty six. I bought. And he said, you know, we cut that over. He said I walked up to cut it over and it was it was one of those classic. He jumped the fence and it went wow. boop. That's awesome. Off. And I was like, yeah, that never happens. Yeah. That's cool. Dude, I came across a YouTube video last night. I can't remember the dude's name. It's Brandon something. Uh-huh. He's got 1.98 million subscribers on his YouTube. And it was like a shed hunting video. And I was like, what? I've never heard of this guy. Mm-hmm. And uh, Toby Stay was in the video. So I was huh. like, okay, so he knows these guys. And they yeah. were shed hunting like this baller property. And like the first thing they found was this giant, uh, just a mega, just a set laying right beside each other. And I was mm-hmm. like, I was like, who is this dude? Huh. I know who Toby is, but. That's weird. Does yeah. he have like a hunting channel? Uh, it's like there's some hunting stuff. The, the whole premise of the video is shed hunting in Illinois. Mm. And, uh, but they, he does like uh, truck truck stuff too and mm. like redneck stuff. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's kind of interesting. Which I'm, we'll, look at, I'm, we'll look at them later. Yeah, I'll yeah. see it. Check them out. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, I felt pretty empowered finding sheds because we found I found some early this year, which was nice. And so it was empowered. like empowered. You at a women's <laughs> rally? <laughs> yeah, man. I was. I felt like an empowered shed hunter at this point. I was like, holy shit! I never find. I usually walk ten miles and don't find anything. I'm like, this sucks. Oh, that's I quit. That's cool. That's exciting. Yeah. So I felt re- rejuvenated with it. Oh man, that's Success. it's fun. It's fun finding sheds. It's you know underrated in some situation you know some kind you know guys are like oh it's a but shed dude, but it's, it's like dude that's so hard imagine finding one of these it's like that's oh, yeah. the a big part of the yeah. trophy of the thing you've been chasing all year well and then you think about like you know there aren't that many of them out there and where every drops it's pretty ass random like mm-hmm. you're just kind of walking through and like there frustratingly it is. random yeah yeah because where you're like i have the one side uh of a buck on that new kentucky place i had them like on camera, five minutes later, he came back with one side. So I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. it's here. And like, I went up in the dress and I'm walking. I'm like, what the f- this is stupid. Like he, <laughs> like he dropped it here and I like look across and he must've just circled. And there it was like laying in this food plot. Mm. But then he had come back through 20 minutes later with nothing. I still can't find that other side. <laughs> it's like, what I the saw, hell? Like uh, where did he get? He didn't like run a mile away and yeah. then come back. Like it's e- right here. Ethan Stubbs, like I was telling you about, yeah. found a match set of a buck. He was hunting. Uh, I think he said he found him like a thousand yards apart. Yeah, 900. 900 oh yards God. apart. Yeah. I found a set 600 yards apart a couple of years ago. Wow. I had this year, I had a, just a small eight pointer coming out of the bedding area, coming out of the main cornfield and like comes back with one side. I'm like, oh, okay, there's one laying out there. So like, most of the bucks were still yeah, holding at happens. this point, and I'm like driving back, and I like every time I go back there, I'm just like, "Where is this freaking shed at?" And I couldn't find it. Finally, I like walked the whole corn. It's not that big. I walked the whole cornfield, still couldn't find it. And I finally gave up. I went home. Next time I'm down, there's like a basically the tractor path along the cornfield, mm-hmm. and then there's a fence line. And I'm like always looking over into the cornfield side whenever I'm going back, and this thing's. 30 yards from the entrance of where <laughs> I pull into the property. And it's just laying right in the, in the tractor path. Like I, Jeez. I drove past this stupid thing three times. Wow. <laughs> That's nuts, man. That's easy to do, man. It's fun when that happens. Like where it's like, there he is. You know, he's right there, yeah. I went out and found a, I don't know what he's, this is a seven, yeah? probably a seven or eight year old, yeah. buck, t- old wow. tight rack deal in Ohio. And he would come past this cor- this uh, camera rather every night. And, uh, there he was, and then there he was with both mm-hmm. sheds off, and I went out the next oh, day both and, and off. found one of them. Yeah, I couldn't nice. make it to have him found I know, the other one. That's yet. the other thing. You know, he's like he dropped that right mm-hmm. there. Like, and it's, that's what you do. Once I found the one, I just start, start walking start spirals, goes, yep. you know. And it's like, I, yeah, I couldn't find it. Yeah. Well, so I found I found a good one off of one of my properties in Cambridge when I first bought it about this time last year. Picked up a pretty good side, and couldn't find the other side, which it's small property, so I figured I'd spray on the neighbors. I ended up getting permission on the neighbors to hunt, looking for a different deer this year, end up finding the other side. And it's like, just see two times sticking up out of water. And it's like, yeah, definitely match. Well, dude, I, we've told the story before, but see the sheds right behind us? Yeah. That's Jeremy ended up killing that buck. Was it three years after he would have held this Holy rack? Holy cow, really? Mm-hmm. So killed it. Dude. It didn't have the sheds at the time. We found mm-hmm. them way after the fact. Yeah, years later. Years wow. later, we're shed hunting, and, and there they were laying side by side yeah. under the grass, just a classic Kansas yeah, find. Jumped, you know? He jumped the fence, and they wow fell right down. Not a tooth mark on them. Just yeah. isn't that that's such a nice. cool set? That's cool. Yeah, white, he probably put on another 15, 18 inches from that at least. Really? A white what whale. What did he score? Oh, when 76, I killed him, right? 76. Yeah. Nice. Very cool. Yeah, giant. But that's what I'm like. I'm looking at this. I'm looking at that one behind you. Like, I mean, I've never found a shed. I mean, I found this shed, which mm-hmm. I had put an arrow in that deer that year. But like, yeah, I couldn't imagine find a shed like that. That's what I'm out. saying. Can you mind walking up on a shed like that? It's like, oh my god, like that's just giant. Like, yeah. We found this one together, S- Spider Man, wow. on public public land in Kansas. And it, what what's that one score? Seventy two. Okay. 72. Yeah, that's my biggest. I found a seventy two yeah. inch and side. We found yeah. it about hundred yards away from another seventy two inch side off, no of, off a big eight point that I'd missed a yeah, few years. An before. Eight point yeah. seventy two inch 72. side. Yeah. Holy yeah. crap. Yeah. Pretty yeah. boy. Monster. Wow. Yeah, heavy. Old Spider wow. Man. It's a mm-hmm. great name. Alex found this one, man. Uh, yeah. Remember when we took him and he got here. lost in Kansas, basically? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he found this one. <laughs> that's a stud. Look at base. I remember like thing. looking and he's like, I found this. I was like, give me Son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a pile of sheds up there now, mm-hmm. too. Yeah, they're starting to stack up, man. I enjoy yeah. it, but it's, I don't know, I I don't get out there that much. I love just, me neither. If I if I get a chance, like, I'm, I'm itching now just to walk. Like, I won't yeah. find anything, or maybe I get lucky and find mm-hmm. one, but it's just, 
It's a great time to be. It's still kind of bare bones. It's good time. Weather feels good. Honestly, it's a nice opportunity to let people on your property. Like, sure. you know, there's a few you probably want to find and just, you know, set the grass. like somebody asked me to mushroom. I don't give a shit about mushrooms. Like, have at it. Like, yeah. Well, and I, I do care. care about the sheds. I want to find some of them, but I have no problem letting people walk. Yeah. And frankly, the more eyes, the better yep. chances you find mm -hmm. them. Yeah, so. bring a whole mm -hmm. bunch of guys down. As long as you it is easy, rules are man. set beforehand. Right, right. right. <laughs> yeah, it, it is not easy. I mean, there's like plenty of these times when we were in Kansas. I mean, we're walking 15 plus miles a day, you know, and... Like we found those two within 150 yards of each other after 10 miles of walking. Yeah, that was shed. long. You know, that is a cool shed. But it's like we were. Long that was probably we was were matched. we were geeking, dude. I found that yeah. one first. It's just like in a little cedar pocket, and so we we're like, "That's amazing. That's awesome." It's Spider Man. And then we walk like another hundred. Oh, you knew the deer. Yeah, yeah we had oh, them on camera. Gotcha. Then we walk like another hundred yards, and this is public, mind you, which we're walking through mm. mainly public. And then we found that other one, and, it's, and we it, had walked. We it's literally a walked ten miles in like at at the single time to get to that shed and we finally find it and it's like ah <laughs> i know we found nothing for so long and then to find two like right in a row is just like wow yeah, yeah. pretty cool very nice yeah it was we were toting colty i think at that time nice. yeah yeah well so what's your plan for this year dude i know we, i mentioned earlier we're talking about the white tail edge mm -hmm. stuff and you just yep. got a new bow and yep. are you like mainly in ohio what's the plan for filming this year if any yeah so i in the past i've done some self-filming stuff and me and my buddy used to film each other quite a bit and we enjoyed that, um, but I, you know, Ben approached me about, you know, seeing if I wanted to film, considering that we were doing some work together. And I was like, yeah, I'll give it a try. Um, didn't, just didn't enjoy the self-filming aspect of it. it. It's one thing, you know, to have a cameraman with you or I enjoy filming other guys, but to, to try and self-film is so much work. And it just Did you really, have a decent, like, one-hander setup? Like yeah, a yeah. No, I, I had a really good setup and everything. It was just... You know, lugging all that crap Sucks, back with it? me and just setting everything up in the morning and just just took away from the experience. It's for me. cool when it pays off and you can rewatch right, it. Like yep. I love watching mm -hmm. it, as shitty as they were. I love watching yep. like the liver shot deer and stuff. But like, man, there's plenty of frustrating times lugging that stuff in. I'm angry when I get into this thing. Well, on top of that, then, you know, potentially making a bad shot because you're rushing a shot, trying to get on footage or something like that. Um, so I, I mean, I feel most of the year and then... Um, Late season, basically the two main bucks I was chasing, one died of EHD and the other one got shot by the neighbor. Late mm. in the season? Yeah, it was like October. Um, wow. The neighbor had pictures of him up until like 15th or 16th of October. Wow. Yeah. And that, mm -hmm. uh, in Ohio there where you're yep. at? Yeah. I mean, there, I guess I don't, I can't confirm for sure. That it it EHD, probably was. But I, was I mean, probably, this year it was late. Remember? Because we talked yeah. to a bunch of people yep. in Iowa and they said like first week of November, they were seeing deer like well, spiraling. Well, we just don't get a the, ton of it, you know, like in our part of Ohio. Do you guys deal with it a lot? Um, so we had a couple, back in 2012, we had a farm in southeastern Ohio, like way down by the river. And there, that was the, that between was the year three we got, neighbors, we had like 50, pe 50 deer or something. Yeah, we got ridiculous. smashed in 2012. Yeah. The next year, I saw one buck the whole year. Wow. Ugh. Yeah. Um, that's the worst. Um, since then, I haven't had any, you know, major. I think 2019 was when we the warden was telling me in Kentucky we got hit yeah, pretty hard. Yeah, we had a couple deer die that year as well, but nothing, one or two deer, I think. Yeah, and then last um, year, depending on where you mm -hmm. were, like Iowa got smoked yep. last year some places. Mm-hmm. Um, so then <laughs> just bouncing around trying to find a buck to hunt. Basically I had a bunch of properties I could hunt, but couldn't really find a mature deer. I had a bunch of four year olds and, and a few of them had really good potential. Didn't really want to shoot them. And then I had, um, one other property you're, that you're at that point, huh? I am. Hold I know for five year olds. Yeah, right. it's. All right. I, I shot a four year old though. That's the problem. Okay. So. All right. All right. <laughs> this is what I'm holding out for. So, um, come late season, I had a. I You're had hanging a, out with Ben Rising too. Yeah, much, I know. Yeah. That's that's the problem. No, ben killed sure. three year old. <laughs> yeah, I should give him crap for that. I'm happy he did. <laughs> Good. Um, so I had a property that I had permission on, 40 acre track, and it had a really good four year old on it that was pretty consistent. And so basically when I, I told Ben, I was like, Hey, I'm not really enjoying this at all. Come late season. I didn't really have a buck to chase anyways. I'm like, I'm, I'm done filming. At that point I ended up going and switching back over, picked up the new Matthews and then all of a sudden had mood to hunt again. So I was like, well, I want to go kill something now. And I had this four year old that was pretty consistent and I knew I wasn't going to be able to hunt the property next year. Mm -hmm. So I was more okay with, with hunting the deer. And so I went in two sits in january that cold snap mm -hmm. uh, killed him and just a big pretty clean eight pointer and 
Walked up to him, I'm like, holy crap, this thing's bigger than I thought he was. He ended up going 146 as an eight point. That's so I was pretty happy with him. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That's really yeah. cool. Um, so, yeah, this next year, I mean, basically, I got two hunts of, after hanging up the camera. Yeah. <laughs> how yep. about that? Yep. It's usually how it works, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is. Um, but so I'm going to be um, hunting primarily Ohio here. I got a couple deer I'm looking forward to this next year. And then hopefully getting out to Illinois at some point, uh, whether that's. I mean, I would consider it even public land if I need to. So, mm -hmm. but I got a pretty good bead on the few deer that I do have here in Ohio, and feel like there's a good chance, you know, early October I could have those deer, one of those deer shot. So, I mean, dude, I think you know this already. You guys are putting in for points for Iowa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Just because there's no reason yep. not to. You also should probably be looking at Kentucky. It's not that far of a hike from you. For I almost bought a property season. down there a couple years ago. Yeah. Um, but. Yeah, never pull the trigger on it. That so. way you can start hunting in September. Yep. Do you guys kill some slammers, like especially in western, western Kentucky, Kentucky, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, hammers. I've never been to that part of the country. I have no idea what it looks uh, like. It looks like... Is that where Weston was at for a while? Yeah. Uh, he was north. He shot some north central down there. That western part of Kentucky looks a lot like Illinois and stuff. I was going to say, it's pretty unique. Yeah, it's, it's not, just, not it's, like Tennessee or southern no, Ohio. It's, it's, it's kind of its farm. own thing. It's big farm country. A lot mm. of cedars. Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that so was where, there's some knobs and stuff on yeah. the river because, I mean, you've got the Ohio and then you've got the Mississippi on the other side. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's Western, you know, it looks like Midwestern hunting. I actually had a, a piece of permission down there this year, and we went down this past summer to, like, hang cameras and stuff, and it's, like, just this ravine that runs up through and just basically you know on a topography map, you know, when I look at Ohio, I see a ridge top and it's like, oh, you know, you got some room mm -hmm. there to work with. And I looked at it and it's like, Basically, the lo the line ran around the ridge top oh, on yeah. the bowl, and yeah. it was just a draw. Like, like oh, oh yeah, there's plenty of plenty of room up there to hunt and stuff. Mm. We get down. I mean, this is a walking path point. Doop. I mean, oh, yeah. This yeah. Is yeah. We've been up, on some down. of those. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah. We hung. It's no wonder those used to be the property lines. Yep. We hung cameras, put up two sets, and never went back. Cameras yeah. still hanging. Yeah, we've done that too. Yeah, yeah. That uh, my property line on my first Kentucky piece is a uh, it's a ridge, and like if you, it's funny if you go up on that ridge, it's like um, blueberries and like a single. Mm single track trail and like those deer walk that top it's really weird but i've had several bucks come off of that top and drop down into the bottom where i hunt them but yeah it's bears all over that property though yeah i mean we walk back and i just see these holes of like honeycomb yeah and all i'm like dude oh, wow. there's gonna be bears all over the place yeah. and we got a bunch of bears on camera mm. yeah yeah there's they're getting thicker in that area Fun stuff, man. It's a good time of year. I was glad to this past weekend. We even for today we were talking about just doing a episode on the farm tours that we did here recently. But it's mm -hmm. nice. It's good. To, it's hard to. We're just in the work grind, you know. It's nice to get out and mm -hmm. get some things done, like some burning, some frost seeding, get our mineral out. Yeah. Take that time to walk. I mean, walk through some stuff that, you know, there's been deer where I'm like curious, you know, where it's mm -hmm. like, well, y you know, what was really happening here, and especially that one that Corey and got away yep. from Corey and I. He's done. Yeah, he's done. We're killing a deer this year. I, I'm just calling it right now. <laughs> yeah, man. It'll be you, you go in and you see it. It's like here he is. That's there he is. Here's the tree I'm moving to, and he's done. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it it really comes down to a, a lot of it, you know. And that's and cameras are great for that, but they also they leave a lot of the unknown, and it's you know some of that unknown is what keeps these deer alive. You know, it's like well, I think he's doing this. I think was he four this year? Three. The one that got past us? Yeah. He was four. Yeah. Four, I'm pretty sure. I, so I have seen, you know, I've we were gonna multiple kill times thought I had a four year old figure it out and everything. And then come five, they're a different animal. Mm, <laughs> I yeah. mean, it's like their pattern is just like nothing like the year before. Yeah. But well, I'm, I'm hoping, could happen, I'm hoping that's not the case because that same thing. I got two bucks that I've like, never had a deer make it to five years old. So <laughs> I, have, I have no idea what to expect. <laughs> but these two bucks, I mean, they're so patternable. I mean, they're, they're done if, mm -hmm. if they don't do anything weird. So the, the good news is that where he's betting there is so dynamite for them. Like, it's just, I don't see any reason that he would leave that. Yeah. Why would he? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And it, it'll actually be a better crop rotation this year. So it was beans last mm -hmm. year. Um, it'll be corn this year. And so it's just, it's so insulated mm -hmm. and it's money. It's, yep. I, we need to like the three of us need to go out and just look at something. You know, I've never been to Jeremy's Ohio or Kentucky really? farm. Wow. Mm -hmm. I've never seen either of them. I see. We were on a Kentucky. I've property. invited myself several times. It just it's <laughs> yeah. never come to fruition. Yeah. yeah, the Ohio one will be good to see now mm -hmm. that it's all yep kind of done. So, dude, you know, Jeremy bought a done. drone. 
Yeah, I did hear that. Yeah, very it's nice. still in the box. I'm pretty sure. I brought oh, it out. On, I well, I actually I messed around with it at the house, and I was gonna go fly it in Ohio, mm -hmm. but it was like 70 degrees that day. So That's sunny. Yeah, it's not um, gonna. I can show you some settings and stuff on the on the thermal side of things to to combat some of the sunniness. Um, it's it's still pretty tough. It's like really it needs to be cloudy to get a really yeah. good read on stuff. But um, you know, you can you can find your when it's sunny, but it's a little tougher. So. Yeah, yeah, because when I mess around it with it at the house it was sunny and like 65 and like mm -hmm. i don't know everything was glowing yeah yeah and you can you can minimize a lot of that noise by yeah. doing some of the you know working with some of the settings but yeah it's yeah pretty bad yeah i played around with it it was pretty cool well there's your resource It'll yeah teach you how to run it yeah no I'm, I'm stoked to have that thing out and and looking at stuff for next year and everything yep so it'll be cool we to kind of missed our window on a survey but yeah yeah Whatever. Yeah, I well, mean, I mean that late. You're not season. leafed out yet. I mean, I would assume you could go in like a like an evening, like a night right now, yeah. and fly it and pick up. You can tell their bucks still. I mean, yeah. even blockheads and stuff. You, I mean, mm -hmm. it takes a little longer, but um, mm -hmm. you can go through and see that. But um, right now, too, you know, you do a late season, you know, herd analysis survey type deal. You know, it's it's not very indicative of where the deer are going to be bedding or no. what they're doing. It's it's you know, even on my property, you know, I. Uh, frankly was watching, you know, cause I didn't want to go in and bump deer out if they're still holding, looking for sheds. And so, you know, and the, you know, the, the main deer I was looking for, you know, he's not even bedded anywhere close to where sure. he normally does in the fall. So if they come out in those bean fields at night, it's got a spotlight, be able to mm -hmm. see them. Oh uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Pretty cool. And that'd be work. So yeah, it'd be cool to see, see what turns up, but man, yeah, it's, uh, the next four weeks, you know, blow by us. We'll be into May and be thinking about mm -hmm. getting beans in the ground. And it's like, holy cow. Yeah. Flies by. Yeah. Pretty wild. Going to Florida here and next week. You're retired. some time. Retire. <laughs> I wish. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> not. We got on vacation? Yeah. Timber yeah. business isn't that great down there. And it's, yeah, it's not that great. I will give you that. We've, Just pines. We've, we've been trying to figure out how we can, we can sell palm trees, but it hasn't really yeah. worked out yet. Palm trees and pines. <laughs> yeah. It's more the nuts have more value. Uh, yeah. So. There yeah. you go. So, uh, well, cool, man. So I know, uh, I followed her along with it cause it's cool to see it, but, um, people can see some of the videos you guys are doing on the tree stand forestry YouTube page. Mm -hmm. And then obviously your social side as well. Yep. Instagram. Mm -hmm. Um, don't post there a ton, but try yeah. and keep up with the YouTube stuff. So. Well, it's cool. I mean, it, people, we've redirected some people over there. If they want to see kind of the journey on on the cut on my Ohio place, mm -hmm. I think you guys did a really good job kind of showing all the different steps and yep. stages of it and stuff. So um, you can check some of those videos out over there. Okay. Very good. It's been a fun project. Yeah, man. It took a little longer than I expected. You kept buying more land, but hey, we got <laughs> <had> her done. <laughs> that will happen. That will happen. I'm done for right now. Maybe. We'll see. We'll see how it goes, but no, dude, we appreciate you driving in and, yeah. and getting on here with us. And, uh, yeah, if anybody wants to check out what Madison and the group's doing, uh, go see the tree stand forestry page and yeah, we will catch y'all next week. Later. It's take me. Oh.